The Country Groom, Bachelor Billionaire Romances Written by Taylor Hart Narrated by James Foey Chapter 1 Montana Cruz stared at the crowd from backstage. How many had shown up tonight? 20,000? 30,000? The arena was big and the crowd electric. Energy surged through Montana like the roar of a diesel engine on a cold winter morning, loud and startling, signaling that it was time to wake up. A satisfied grin spread across his lips. Being a country western music star had always been his dream, and it was a good life. Tiffany Chance and her band Fusion had the crowd on their feet, swaying from side to side. Looking up, he caught a glimpse of Tiffany's husband, Sam Dumont, in the VIP section. Sam pointed at him and Montana pointed back. Various football players from the Storm and the Destroyers were with Sam. Another football player, his neighbor and friend, Cameron Cruz, stood next to Montana and bit his lip. I don't know if I can do this. Montana grinned, happy he could help make Cam's dreams come true. Oh, you're doing it. I bought the rights to your song on the condition that you'd perform with me a couple of times a year. Obviously, Montana didn't need Cam to do this. No, Cam needed to do this for himself. Cam chuckled as he clenched and unclenched his fists. I feel like it's the opening game of football season. Montana gave him a heavy pat on the back. You'll do fine. Out of nowhere, he caught sight of golden white hair in the crowd. Like Lily's hair. Frantically, he looked for her but didn't find her. Of course it wasn't her. Everywhere he went, she danced at the corners of his vision but he hadn't seen her since he'd left Springs Hollow seven years ago. She'd made her choice. Some of the electricity faded, and he turned to his manager, Kirk. How much longer is this set? Kirk put up two fingers. Two minutes, boss. You don't think my song's kinda cheesy? Cam gulped back a swallow. Montana scoffed. Songs about first love are always cheesy. Cam sucked in a breath and nodded, turning a bit pale. He let out a breath. How come I have no problem facing down linebackers and defensive tackles, but this... He trailed off and searched the crowd. Montana nudged him. Because every time you sing, you bare your soul. He sighed and gazed at the crowd. Come on, Cam. Think of it like throwing a perfect spiral into the end zone. Easy. Yeah, Cam scoffed. Lily's face flashed into his mind, and Montana looked for her again. At least he had the perfect life when he wasn't thinking about her, his first love. Last night, once again, he'd been plagued by her face in his dreams. Closing his eyes, he tried to push away the thought of her. The harder he pushed, the more the memories haunted him. The first time he'd seen her, she was sitting on the edge of the Springs Hollow swimming hole. He'd only been in town a week. Jason, a kid in his new foster family, had convinced him to come. Lily sat in the dirt with her three friends, wearing a pink polka dot halter top swimsuit. She was a siren calling out to him. When their eyes locked, he could swear there'd never been anything like her before and there never would be after. Instant attraction. His hands had gotten sweaty, and he'd been tongue-tied when Jason introduced all the girls. The only name seared into his brain was hers. Lily Ray Gold. Reaching out, she'd taken his hand all professional-like. Want me to teach you how to go on the rope swing? A big, dopey grin had filled his face. Yeah. After they'd climbed to the top, she held out the long knotted rope to him. He pushed it back to her. You first. Are you a scaredy cat? His heartbeat quickened. Warm chills rushed through him. For the first time in his life, he actually wanted to get to know a girl. Smiling, he put the rope between them. Then let's do it together. 
Then they were flying, falling through the air. Her laughter had rained down hot against his face. Fighting against falling in love with her had been as useless as fighting against gravity. Montana! Like the chilly water at Springs Hollow, Cam's shout got his attention. We're on! Lily Ray Gold, L.R. Gold to her legal associates, watched the concert from the sidelines. It wasn't her choice to be here. Hot wrath rose up inside of her. Refusing to go closer to watch the show, she stayed on the edges of the fence line. She wanted to bolt, run, leave like any reasonable person would do if they were this close to a hot, bubbling, magma-filled volcano. But she couldn't. She'd promised Jason she would finish this mess. Tears instantly stung her eyes and she pushed her emotions down. She wouldn't disappoint Jason any more than she could forget the memory of his hand inside of hers and his soft words as he'd pleaded with her to deliver the envelope in person. Dang. She kicked the side of the fence and listened to the stupid, whiny country music. Her phone, vibrating against her side, pulled her from her dark thoughts. Brad. Clearing her throat, she stuck her ear to the phone and plugged her other ear with her hand. Hey, I take it you got there safely? The relationship had developed in an office setting, following long nights working on cases. Although she'd been reluctant to get close to anyone, Brad was fun. Yes, you said you'd call, Brad reminded her. It wasn't in her nature to be responsible for her time to anyone, this part of any relationship was something she didn't care for. Oh, sorry. Yep, I'm here. So you're watching the concert? I'm not watching, she insisted. I'm waiting for it to end. The crowd got louder, and it was impossible to carry on a conversation. Sorry, I'll call you later, she yelled. Shutting off her phone, she glanced at the big stage. Smoke flooded the arena and Montana appeared on a lift in the center of the stage. He wore a black hat, and his head was tilted down. A black muscle shirt emphasized his tanned, toned biceps. Dark jeans and black boots completed the dramatic image. A screen played snippets of various country music videos where beautiful women danced and some good old boys laughed. When Montana had made it big, she'd vowed never to listen to his music and she'd made good on her promise. Every time his deep voice came on the radio, she turned it off. If she went to a club and his guitar solo started over the speakers, she left. By all accounts, Lily had taken great care to scrub her life free of ever knowing Montana crew. For a second, as she watched Montana bring the mic to his lips, her mouth went completely dry. He was gorgeous and she recognized the song. It was the one he'd played the first night she'd known she was in love. She remembered sitting next to Jason, the bonfire across from them. Montana played a song on his guitar for them. At first, Lily had only listened because Montana was so cute. He had a slow, sweet smile, and his green eyes always lit up when she entered the room. The magnet-like pull she felt for him got her attention. But when she heard him play and then sing, she'd been lost. He was good, more than good. It was like one of the times she'd been in art class and seen a picture of Starry Night by Van Gogh for the first time. Immediately, she'd recognized greatness. She had seen it in him then only 16 and singing a song she'd never heard before, one he'd made up. The words had been so raw, so vulnerable, so everything. They'd made her feel like the first time she'd tasted homemade peach ice cream when she was five at her grandmother's house. Surprised and delighted, she wanted more and knew nothing would ever be better. When he'd finished... Two of her friends sat on the ground staring up at him, completely starstruck. They wore the same look when they watched MTV and Bon Jovi. But it didn't matter. 
because the only one Montana looked at was her. The music ended and the arena went wild. Finally, she let out a sigh of relief. She would give him the envelope and be done with Montana crew forever. Chapter Two Montana sat in his dressing room chair. Sweat beaded on his head, and he pulled a handkerchief out of his pocket. Closing his eyes, he smiled, loving how every part of his body vibrated. It was always this way after a show. This vibrating, this release. He had a room full of people he had to go meet and greet, but he told them to give him a five-minute break. Relaxing back against the chair, he let himself breathe deeply. There was a knock at the door. Boss, there's some attorney here. There's some legal thing she says needs taken care of, Kirk called out. Keeping his eyes closed, he waved a hand in dismissal. Take care of it, Kirk. Boss, she insists you have to sign it off before the court or something. Says she represents Jason Given. His eyes flipped open. Standing, his heart rate spiking, he threw back the door. Lily Ray Gold. The intense blue eyes. The color of the great big Wyoming sky on a clear day. Her hair was like rays of pure sunshine, still long and luscious. She wore a red skirt and top, all business-like, with heels that made her almost eye level. Her lipstick matched the dress, and her eyes were drenched in black. She looked the same, but also completely different from the girl he'd known. His heart cranked up to 120 miles an hour, faster than he'd ever gone on the back roads of Jackson Hole in his Porsche. I saw your hair in the crowd. It was the first thing out of his mouth before he could turn his filter on. Cocking an eyebrow, she gave him a bored look. It felt strange, having her look at him like that. They'd always had this thing. Every time they looked at each other, even before they'd actually known each other, they'd smiled like they were sharing secrets. She held up her hand, offering an envelope. Reflexively, he put his hand out. She plunked down the envelope, her eyes meeting his. You have officially been given the last contents of Jason Givens' estate. Please sign here. She grabbed a pen from Kirk and snagged his clipboard. Jason's dead? Their eyes held for a second. Then she scoffed. She thrust the clipboard and pen at him. Sign here, please. His thoughts were a flurry of memories and mixed emotions he couldn't get a hold of. She tapped the clipboard. Sign here, please. But she moved closer to him, and her eyes widened. Sign the paper, Montana, and I'll give you what Jason wanted you to have. He tried to focus, then swiped the pen and signed his name. Thank you. She shoved the clipboard back at Kirk and gave Montana a nod. Our business is finally over. Wait. Montana followed her. Turning on her heel, she flipped her long blonde hair over her shoulder, leveling him with a glare. It's not much fun to watch someone else ride off into the sunset, is it? Montana sat in his Jackson Hole home a day later, staring at the envelope in his hand. He still hadn't opened it. Moving it back and forth in his hands, he could tell it was a key. He'd gone through the motions of getting on his jet and getting back to Jackson. He'd been exhausted, but he held the envelope even when he crashed into his bed. This morning, he'd gotten up, drank coffee, and gone for a horse ride. Now he was sitting at his kitchen table, staring at the envelope. He couldn't explain the myriad of emotions creeping through him. Seeing Lily had done something to him. More than that, hearing Jason was dead had unlocked all the stuff he'd buried, dug up again and then put away, and vowed to never examine or think about again. Now it wouldn't go away. His thoughts were all sticky and gunky. His gut hurt like it was an engine filled with bad oil. A knock sounded at the door, a distinguishable Hunter James knock. Montana suddenly remembered Hunter had asked for a Junto meeting this morning. Crap. 
Montana didn't move, but he heard Marta, the woman who worked for him, open the front door. How are you today, Marta? Beautiful day, isn't it? Hunter's voice boomed through the front entrance. No, he couldn't deal with the meeting, the playful banter of the guys as they discussed which charity to give to. Putting on a controlled face, he moved into the front entrance to greet his neighbor and business mogul friend. Hunter had a big, stupid grin on his face. His military frame filled the doorway. He took off his cowboy hat and walked in. Did you get the text from Cam saying he won't be here today? I guess he stayed for some wild time in Vegas. Hunter rolled his eyes. He's been married two months. Shouldn't the honeymoon be over? He let out a deep laugh. Hope he plays a good hand for me. Montana snorted. Hunter had won his land in Jackson on a good hand of poker. A text pulsed in the phone in Montana's pocket. Hunter pulled his phone up. Oh, it looks like Sterling's on some movie shoot and won't be able to make it either. Jerk. I can't do this today. All Montana's control slipped away. In fact, the longer he held on to the envelope in his hand, the less he felt like he had any control at all. The doorbell sounded, chiming a western tune from his first album. Marta opened the door. Cooper Harris walked in, immaculately put together. He wore a blue polo shirt and khaki shorts paired with loafers. Nice shoes. Hunter laughed and shook his head. Seriously, loafers. Cooper rolled his eyes and snorted. Do you think the flaw in your personality that feels the need to comment on my appearance in a negative way somehow endears you to me? He spoke in a condescending tone. Hunter stopped mid-snort. Well, I didn't know you cared so much about what I think. Hunter had sensed weakness, and Montana knew he was about to light into the positive thinking master. I need you both to leave. Abruptly, Montana turned away from them, feeling perspiration at his hairline, and touching it lightly as he rushed through his dining room and opened the sliding door. The cool morning mountain air was semi-refreshing. He hurried to his music studio. He heard the sliding door open. Would you wait up? Hunter was on his heels. Glancing back, he saw Cooper had followed too and was closing the sliding door. Hunter was almost to him. Montana couldn't explain all of this to them. Emotion surged into him, and he tore into his studio, going straight to his guitar stool and falling onto it. I have to work, he growled at Hunter, and then glared at Cooper as they followed him inside anyway. Hunter stopped next to the other stool. He stood with his hands on his hips, and his flashy belt buckle almost blinded Montana as the sun hit it. What's wrong with you? Montana still held the envelope. His hand began to shake. He felt moisture pooling at the corners of his eyes. He put his head into his other hand and flung the envelope onto the coffee table in front of him. Go away. He made a last attempt to growl out in anger before succumbing to plain weakness. Cooper went directly to the coffee table, picked up the envelope, and sat across from Montana on the couch. Montana. His voice was cool, calm, concerned, and slightly counselorish. What's wrong? Montana couldn't say anything. The shaking had started in the center of his gut and was now working its way through him the same kind of shaking he'd felt when he'd been put in foster care for the first time, the same kind of shaking he'd felt when his ex-wife had lost the baby, their baby, standing in the hospital, watching her cry. It had undone him. He couldn't stop thinking of his friend Jason. He was gone. He thought he'd lost him and little before when he left, but that had been his choice. Having Jason ripped away from this world where Montana couldn't even apologize, was a thousand times worse. Whoa. Hunter sat next to Cooper on the couch across from him. It's okay, bud. Tell us what's going on. Cooper eyed him, keeping the envelope in his hand. Can I open it? Montana wanted to tell him to take it somewhere the sun don't shine. 
but then he reached forward and took the envelope from him. I'll open it. This was ridiculous. The shaking subsided for a second. Yes, he had to be decisive. When he ripped off the end and turned the envelope to the side, a key fell into his hand. He reached into the envelope with his fingers and pulled out the note, and then hesitated. Did he want to know what Jason had to say to him? Words from beyond the grave. The hair on the back of his neck stood up. All these years he'd shut Jason out, blamed him for what happened between him and Lil. His hand shook again. He stood and read the letter. Montana, if you're reading this, I'm dead. First, I'm sorry, but you must know Lily never loved me. I kissed her, you saw it, that's all. I've had cancer and fought the good fight. I want you to know I forgave you a long time ago for leaving, but I'm not gonna lie, I missed you. I missed you a lot. If Lily brought this key to you, I'm sure she didn't stay and chat. She's still pretty mad at you, understandably. Listen, go get her, find out her secret, then forgive her, and let her forgive you. Oh, and go see my parents. They've missed you more than you can imagine. Ask them about the key. Again, I'm sorry, Montana. I truly am. We almost had everything, didn't we? Your friend forever, Jason. Montana sat there, tears spilling down his cheeks. Eight years. Eight years and he hadn't looked back once. But he hadn't known Jason was dying. Gripping the key tightly in his hand, he stood, throwing the letter onto the table and hating the tears on his face. He couldn't believe it. It felt like someone had just taken a song he'd poured his heart and soul into and erased the best notes. Sucking in a breath, he steadied himself. Squeezing his eyes shut, he thought of his friend, of the 16-year-old boy who had welcomed him into his home and treated him like a brother. Stabbing pain seared into his heart. Cindy and Frank, Jason's parents, they were the best foster parents he'd ever had. His eyes flashed open. Were they okay? Cindy must be crushed. She had so much love in her being that it overflowed, even washing over Montana when he'd arrived on their doorstep. Frank was a bit more reserved, the old school kind. Never cried in front of people. Montana knew losing Jason would make him cry. He tried to steady his breathing. This kind of emotion hadn't surfaced in him since his wife had left him four years ago. He sucked in another long breath. Hunter stood with his fists clenched, looking ready to go fight a war. What do you need, man? Who deserves a pounding? Cooper sat coolly on the couch. What can we do to help? Montana let out another breath and gestured to the letter. My best friend died. A friend I abandoned a long time ago. He wasn't going to get into the nitty gritty. Hunter eyed his hand. And left you a key? Montana shrugged. Moving to the window, he stared out at his property. What was Jason talking about? Lily had a reason to be mad? The day he left, he'd caught them in a lip lock. He'd seen it. She was kissing him, too. It was the day after graduation. The day they were supposed to elope, the motorcycle was gassed, his bag was packed, they'd planned it. He thought of the night before, when she'd been in Montana's arms at the old fort. He stared out at the vast property that backed up to the mountains, at his horse corrals and the pool, and when he looked to the west, the gardens. His mind flashed to Lily Ray, and the snotty way she'd thrust the clipboard into his chest and demanded a signature. Rushing back to the letter, he picked it up and crumpled it, taking the envelope and the key and throwing it into the trash. Hunter grunted. That's right. Focus on the future. Let the past go. Montana nodded his agreement. Forget him. Forget them. 
Without warning, pain hit him like a bullet to his chest. He fell to his knees. Jason. He gripped his chest and cursed. Why, why, why? Both Cooper and Hunter were instantly next to him, trying to help him up. Montana thought of leaving them, Lil and Jason, that day. Driving off on the motorcycle, both of them yelling behind him. It had taken him less than a year to go get a record deal. Call it divine providence or sheer luck, he didn't care what it was. All he knew was that he'd worked his tail off to build up his career. He'd written and sung and traveled the world. After the first year of making it, Montana had hired an investigator to find out what happened to Jason and Lily. He found out she had lived in Denver for a year, then moved to Billings and gone to college. Jason worked at the coal mine in Springs Hollow. After that, he'd put it to bed. All of it. Now he was confused. A million questions went through his mind. She'd looked and acted so professional. Cooper and Hunter put him on the couch. They both sat on the coffee table in front of him. Are you okay, man? Hunter asked. Cooper leaned forward, extracted the key from the trash, and held it up. It seems you have something pressing you you should probably deal with, Montana. Do you need our help? He held the key out. Cooper was known for his relationship help. He held seminars at his vast property a few miles down the road. He'd built a whole one-stop love headquarters they all teased him about. Normally, Montana would never get anyone mixed up in his problems. But he didn't have a choice. He glanced up at both of his friends. What do you do when your first love comes and tells you your best friend is dead? Hunter's brow creased and he let out a sigh. Oh, man. He'd never spoken much about his military experience, but Montana knew Hunter wasn't a stranger to friends dying on him. He'd gotten all mushy one night after a few beers, told them things Montana had tried to brain erase, things that had given Montana a great respect for Hunter. Cooper reached forward and plunked the key down on the couch beside him. Well, what do you want to do? Montana let out a trigger of a laugh. Typical response from you, Mr. Life Guru. This was both the cool thing about Cooper and also the thing that drove the rest of them a bit batty. Cooper always seemed to know the answers, even if that meant pushing Montana to answer the question he needed to answer. It's not that simple, Montana whispered, and he looked away. Cooper stood, moving to the side of the room and shoving his hands into his pockets. It never is. Montana surveyed the key on the couch for a few seconds, thinking of Lily Ray and the way she'd stalked off like he deserved to be told about Jason that way, like he deserved to be spurned and left to deal with it all by himself. He whipped out his phone, pulling it to his ear. His assistant, Kirk, answered on the first ring. Sup, boss? The lawyer that delivered the letter to me. Where does she work? Uh... It sounded like he was shuffling papers. I'm looking at my clipboard, and it says L.R. Gold, attorney at law. It says Quentin Burke and Lyon Associates, out of Billings, Montana. Hesitating briefly, Montana couldn't believe what he was about to do. I want you to find out everything about her firm. Find out if she's been married and give me her personal address. Okay, Kirk laughed. Are you okay, boss? You sound kind of cagey. At that moment, the pain in the center of his chest subsided. I'm fine, Kirk. I'm more focused than I've been in a long time. He got off the phone. Hunter and Cooper were now both standing next to the music room door, looking back at him. Both had grins on their faces. What? Montana stood, challenging them. Cooper turned to the open door. It's good, dealing with stuff. Good luck, my friend. Hunter had a dumb, happy look on his face. Seems like you're about to cowboy up and take back the woman of your dreams. Yeehaw! Dramatically, he slapped the side of his leg and followed Cooper out.
Montana watched them go. A strange surge of determination rushed through him. She's not the woman of my dreams. But even as he said the words, he knew he would dream of her once again tonight. Chapter Three Lily filed her final brief for the Macmillan case and pushed back from her desk. She relished the feeling of being done with something, having it complete. The little girl would be going to a stable family. She'd worked with the social worker and personally checked out the adoptive parents. They wanted her, and she deserved to be wanted. It was unusual for Lily to take even a couple minutes to breathe between cases, she liked taking life head on. It wasn't her style to sit around. But this last case, where the court had to decide which home the kids should go to, had taken the emotional energy out of her. Coupled with the funeral last week and the little task of taking that stupid envelope to Montana, it had been a rough few days. Staring out the window, she looked at the people in the park below. It had only been a year since she'd joined the firm, but she'd quickly worked up from associate to junior associate. It might not sound like much to some, but it was everything to her. Their focus was primarily family law, which was her passion. While some attorneys hated working with divorces and dealing with the complications children presented, this was what she loved most, making sure the kids were taken care of. She was good at it. Of course, like most attorneys, Another of her passions was getting her name on the door, too. Since it was a small practice, she figured she could achieve that in three to five years if she kept her nose down and did good work. Sup, Buttercup? Her friend and assistant, Charity, walked in the door. Charity was quirky. Today, her brown hair was tied up on the sides in Princess Leia buns. She whisked around the room, picking up files and replacing them with other files. She made up for her quirkiness with her excellent organizational skills. Lily felt caught and jerked back to her desk. Nice blue sky today. You should take the rest of the day off and go for a hike. Or just go lay in the park and let the vitamin D soak in. She winked at her. I'm sure Brad would go with you, she said in sing-song. Charity's goal in life was getting Lily to take a vacation day or getting her and Brad hooked up. She was a part-time law student at MSU, but she was generally more of a free spirit. This was why she was the same age as Lily and still not done with school. She'd taken off a semester and backpacked through Europe, saying she would never regret the extra school loans. Lily let out a light laugh. Right. Charity moved to her desk. Listen, today is a day one should do something like scale a mountain or skydive or something... Come on, I'll even go with you. Lily snorted. You know how to scale a mountain? Charity grinned. Hey, didn't I tell you I was a climbing guide one summer? Lily wasn't surprised, and she grinned back. That's pretty cool. Picking up a file on top of the stack, she opened it. Looks like the Carter boy has another court date. Five days. You have to file in five or the boy goes back to his father. Lily's heart sank. The boy's father was more than just verbally abusive. Unfortunately, they hadn't been able to find concrete proof. Lily had spoken with the little guy, Jared, and he was just the sweetest thing. She focused. Okay, I'll be looking this over for the rest of the day. Charity sighed. You just got done with the Carol girl. You deserve to have a little fun now and then. Plus, there was the funeral and that other thing you had to take care of. Charity picked up another case file off the side of Lily's desk and lightly tapped her shoulder with it. Heads up, Brad's coming your way now. Probably wants a lunch date. Butterflies circled in her stomach. Brad had gone with her to Jason's funeral, and it had meant a lot to her. Brad walked through the door, a big grin on his face. His blonde hair was gelled in a retro urban way. A pale blue tie accentuated his silver suit, He'd been a basketball player, and it showed in his height and athletic build. He was also good-looking. They'd both gone to law school at Montana State, 
He was six years older than her and had just made partner six months ago, making him the youngest partner at the firm. She'd been assigned to work with him on a couple of cases, and he'd taught her a lot. She admired him. He was diligent, smart, and competent. Pausing in front of her desk, he scrunched up his nose. I'm not going to give you a chance to tell me you're too busy or you aren't hungry. I've missed you, and you never texted me and told me when you got back, so the way I see it, you owe me lunch. Staring at the checkmate look on his face, she shook her head. When had he come to know her so well that he already had counterarguments to her points? A smile played on her lips, and he narrowed his eyes. He reached out his hand to her. Come on, you know you want to. He said it in a low, throaty voice. Lily always tried to make her boundaries with men clear. She had to. Lily hadn't allowed herself to get serious with anyone. She dated, but it never felt right to her. Sometimes, late at night, she wondered if it would ever feel right again. Wondered if falling in love so hard the first time had somehow ruined her. Plus, she'd been driven to get through her bachelor and law degrees, working part-time to keep student loans to a minimum. There'd never been a lot of time for dating. Charity let out a sigh and went for the door. Don't make the man beg, Lily. Lily stared at Brad's all-American good looks and suddenly wanted to go, partly because she liked him and partly because Charity was right. She did deserve to have a little fun. She stood. Fine, but I only have an hour. He grinned. The Carter case? She nodded. And we have to talk details over lunch. She moved around her desk, grabbing her purse. He took her hand. You drive a hard bargain. Half an hour later, Lily sat at her favorite French restaurant, waiting for her food and listening to Brad's strategy for the case. Do you think we can prove abuse? Brad nodded. We have a witness, the maid, if she would talk. Unfortunately, she's refusing to. Lily tried to ignore the flashes of irritation in her gut. It was beyond her why people wouldn't get involved in something when a child's life was on the line. Then you have to make her. Brad gave her a soft smile. Don't give me a rah-rah speech. What? We're fighters, warriors. Brad, you have to get her to talk. You can do this. I know you can. You're Brad Walker, attorney at law. Your name is on the door. It means something. His grin widened. Fine, all right, man, he said, letting out a breath. I guess that's why I keep you around to remind me who I am. She liked this interplay between them. Dang straight. She started humming the soundtrack for Rocky. He laughed. Stop. Then he reached for her hand across the table, placing his on top, his mood sobering. How are you? The softness of his tone didn't affect her. She might have been vulnerable yesterday at the concert, but she'd recovered. Eight years of hiding her emotions had trained her well. Returning his smile, she let her fingers lace with his. Brad had been trying to get closer to her. After the funeral, he'd wanted to come in and stay with her that night, but she'd refused him. Standing on the porch, holding her, he'd simply kissed the top of her head and told her, Lily, I want more with you, but I won't push. Now she gave him a soft smile. I'm good. He put his other hand over their hands, his smile deepening. Leaning closer, he brushed his lips over hers. Nervous flutters filled her stomach. The smell of his aftershave wafted toward her. It was light and spicy. She liked it. Pulling back a bit, he flashed her a grin. I was worried you'd been swept off your feet by Montana crew. Even though he'd said the name as a joke, like water to a flame, the mere mention of Montana cooled everything inside of her. Untangling her hand from his, she placed them lightly on her lap. Funny. Wait, Lily. Brad chastised, but he didn't attempt to get her hand back. Scrunching up his nose, he took a sip of water. It just kind of came as a shock to me when you told me you two had been an item in high school. The only reason she'd told Brad was because he'd been with her at the funeral when Jason's mom had asked her when she'd be taking Montana the envelope. Rolling her eyes, 
She focused on keeping her breathing even. She'd found this tactic useful during law school when she was stressed during exams. It was a long time ago. Settling back into his chair, Brad nodded. You said that, but you saw him last night, right? You know I did. He nodded again. Right, you gave him the envelope for Jason. Yep. What did he say? Averting her eyes, she lifted one shoulder. Nothing. Nothing? Glancing back, she noticed Brad's arms were crossed, and his face had gone serious. Are you jealous? Straightening, he uncrossed his arms. Me? No, no, no. I mean, why would I be jealous of an old boyfriend you get weird about every time his name is mentioned? I don't get weird, she said quietly. Yes, you do. His voice was wistful. The food was brought to the table and served. Putting her napkin on her lap, Lily sighed. Maybe she did get a bit weird about Montana, but she wasn't going to explain it to Brad. Taking a bite, she pulled out her phone, checking her email. So you're going to handle this conversation by not handling it? It was a tactic in negotiation. Brad had taught it to her. Not liking that Brad called her on her crap, but gaining respect for him because he was smart enough to know how, she gave him a little smile and shoved her phone back into her purse. No, I'm going to talk to you. Holding a fork full of food in midair, he narrowed his eyes. This is new. She took a bite and didn't agree or disagree. Okay, so you had a relationship with Montana Crew? His voice had taken on a lawyerly tone. Yes, she said, voice clipped. What ages? She let out a breath. Come on, Lily. I just found out you have a best friend that died and I didn't even know about him. You never mentioned Jason before last week. Why would I? She pushed back. Ah, uh, let's see, maybe because we've been friends for a couple of years? Maybe because we're together a lot and we've been dating for a few months? She wasn't going to argue with him, but she wasn't going to feel bad. I have a past, so what? She challenged. A past you never talk about, friends and old boyfriends you never talk about. Briefly, she hesitated and then rolled her eyes. Fine, we dated sophomore through senior years. Then you broke up after graduation. Yep, she closed her eyes and reveled in the taste of tender veal. Lily, he said patiently. Flashing open her eyes, she matched his challenging gaze. Yes, and you never spoke again. All of these details she'd told him. Correct. A puzzled look passed over his face. What was in the envelope? She shook her head. I don't know. You didn't stay in chat? Do the polite talk? The idea of it elicited a light laugh out of her. Ah, uh, no. Seeming to be confused, he quietly ate his food for a few moments. Not wanting to talk about it, she did the same. You're weird about him. No, I'm not. She took another sip of water, hating the way Brad could see into her soul. Putting his silverware on his plate, he leaned back into his chair. I've known you for three years, and you've never acted this way about a guy. He snapped his fingers. You act this way about the cases sometimes. He nodded emphatically. You get flustered when you're fighting for those kids, but you never get flustered at any other time, except now. If I get flustered, which I don't, while I'm fighting for those kids, it's because they have no one else to fight for them. I know. He looked at her solemnly. Why do you think I requested you to help me on these cases? Even while you were interning for us as a law student, you were all heart. She did not like the way he was looking at her. Like he could ever know the real reason she got flustered when the name Montana Crew was mentioned. Brad focused on his food for a few bites before putting down his fork. You dated a lot of guys in college, right? This was not the turn in conversation she expected. Another laugh came out of her at his increased jealousy. You're being ridiculous. Admit it, you dated a lot of guys in college. She'd never thought of it like that. I worked as a program planner and I attended a lot of functions. I had to have someone with me. I wouldn't call it dating. 
Giving her a patronizing look, he cut into his chicken. Those guys were interested, believe me. This whole turn of conversation was making her feel trapped. Oh, please. He pointed his fork at her. Honestly, I didn't think you'd make it unmarried out of law school. Stop, she dismissed him. Apparently, Brad didn't know her as well as he thought. What? Are you denying you had a lot of choices? I know at least two of those guys proposed to you. Controlling her emotions had become a necessity as an attorney. He couldn't let people have that much insight. But she knew she was blushing. Cocking his head to the side, he smiled. Lily, my point is that you're beautiful and smart, and I can hardly believe I'm lucky enough to date you. Hearing the defenselessness in his voice softened her. It's true, he insisted, rolling his eyes and letting out a sigh. Man, I guess I've just lost all my leverage revealing how much I like you. Hesitating, Lily reached out and covered his hand with hers. You haven't lost any leverage. I like you too. He smiled. For a moment, he searched her face. Then he asked, Are you still in love with him, Lily? No, she puffed out. Giving her a slow nod, his lip cocked to the side. Okay, then that's that. Okay, she agreed. He paid the check and they walked to his car hand in hand. When they got to it, he opened her door and paused, pulling her into him and staring deeply into her eyes. I'm glad you're not in love with a country rock star. She smiled at him. I'm focused on becoming partner, you know that. He kept her close, touching his lips softly with hers. Is that all? The lower part of her stomach fluttered. Staying true to his word, Brad had taken it slow with her, giving her space. As they had evolved into more, she realized she did like him. A lot. I might like dating this tall, handsome attorney. He pulled back, the side of his lip tugging up. Oh yeah? He looked genuinely pleased. Can I get that in writing? Flippantly, she rolled her eyes and giggled. Pulling her back in, he kissed her again. This time, he deepened the kiss. Warmth filled her, and she let herself relax into him. He pulled back. I plan on getting to know you a lot better, and I don't want any old rock star boyfriends getting in the way. She flashed a smile. Believe me, you don't need to worry. Chapter 4 She'd just gotten back and settled into work when Charity ran into Lily's office like she'd seen a ghost. Oh my gosh, Charity put her hand to her head. Lily paused. What's wrong? Charity put both hands in front of Lily's desk and leaned forward. I always knew you had something in your past, something really cool that you kept hidden, some lost love. Lily frowned. What are you going on about? Charity let out a light sigh, then stopped and wiped under her eyes. Sheesh, I need to check my makeup. Charity. Lily didn't like to use the mom voice on her, but it usually calmed her down. Montana crew came in while you were gone. Lily let that sink in, and then yanked back from her desk. She stood, feeling herself start to tremble. I know you had to go deliver an envelope to someone in Vegas. Is this about that? Charity was clearly perplexed and excited all at once. When I told him you were at lunch, he said he'd come back in an hour. Uh, yeah. Lily wasn't an avoid-the-situation type of person normally, but this was different. She grabbed her purse and went to her other office door, the one that led to the service elevator. Where are you going? Charity demanded. Lily glanced back while opening the door. If anyone asks, I had a dental emergency. Thanks. What about Montana Crew? Lily hesitated before shrugging and drifting out the door. Tell him to stay away from me. Bypassing the service elevator, she hurried to the stairwell and rushed down. It was four flights, but she moved so fast it felt like her feet were barely touching the ground. Good thing she'd been doing all that triathlon training this year. She would be able to make her escape quickly. Dashing out the door, she crossed the street, looking back and forth for cars. 
she rushed into the parking lot where she kept her car. He was here? Montana was here. She felt like she was running away from an oncoming tornado. She needed to duck for cover and hole up until the storm was gone. She was almost at her old Camry, the one she'd bought her first year in law school with hard-earned waitressing money, when she stopped short. Montana. Right by her Camry. Shoot, he'd foiled her evasion plan. He was propped against the Camry. Propped in that way that cool guys used, half leaning and half looking all pouty and brokenhearted. The cowboy hat was plopped down on his head in his trademark style. She had no idea why he wore it. He had great thick black hair that was shaved on the sides and longer on top. Not that she'd noticed at the concert. She hadn't. He had on his black cowboy boots, dark jeans, and a button-down black shirt. A shirt that looked like silk. Not that she cared about that either. Anger burned through her. What are you doing here? The side of his lip tilted up, and he pushed up his cowboy hat, looking her blatantly up and down. I didn't get a good look at you the other night, Lil, and I knew I'd seen you in the audience. A rabbit. That's how she felt. She needed to run. I knew you'd try to bolt. That's what you always did when Mr. Swenson would gut on you about something in math, remember? Based on your actions the other day, I figured you wouldn't want to see me again. That's why you let off the explosive and ran, wasn't it? The memory of her and Jason in Montana letting off those explosives they'd found in her father's shed fell through her. They had literally dropped them down the old mine shaft outside of town and then run as fast as they could to their motorcycles. An unwilling grin filled her face. He pointed at her like he'd caught her. Are you thinking of the mine shaft? She didn't say yes or no. Man, he sighed and pulled off his hat. I was thinking about that on the way into town today. We did some crazy stuff, you know that? But she wasn't going to do that. This, whatever this was. What do you want, Montana? Pulling in a long breath, he let his grin disappear. He held out his hand with the key in it. And? This was in the envelope. I gathered that. She'd felt the key, but she hadn't asked. All she knew was she'd made a deathbed promise to Jason to get the envelope to Montana, and she'd done her part. Why didn't anyone notify me when he died? Rich. That is completely rich coming from you. They did. He flinched. What? Cindy and Frank tried to get word to you, but you kind of have something akin to the Berlin Wall around you. Cocking his head to the side, he rubbed his eyebrow. Oh. Why do you think I had to deliver the key personally? Her confidence came back. It always did when she felt like she was on the right side of something. She closed the gap between them and got in his face. They notified your organization that Jason died. And guess what your organization did? What? Send flowers. They were beautiful. Your assistant has good taste. She glared at him. Clearing his throat, he looked away. I didn't know, but you're right. My people deal with stuff like this because my life gets crazy. Right. Yes, I know. You're a famous country star. Big deal. For the record, I don't care about your life, and I don't keep track of it. Okay, he said slowly. This was insane. Why had she said that? Look, the point is you don't get stuff from your best friend all the time. The air puffed out of her. All of a sudden, Montana put up a hand to cut her off. His eyes grew hard. He wasn't my best friend, and he sure as heck wasn't family. He turned away from her and sucked in a breath. Lily noticed she was breathing hard too. She looked away and tried to figure out what to do. She moved for her car. So that's it. Getting into the car, she looked back. What? Montana moved to the side of her car door. You drop some key into my hand, and when I come to you for help, you ditch me? Her lips pinched into a frown. She yanked the door shut and started the car rolling down the window. Stay away 
from me. Shifting into reverse, she pushed hard on the gas, shoved it into drive, and took off. Chapter 5 Montana watched the Camrys scream out of the parking garage and rushed after her. Glancing back, he caught her eyes in the rearview mirror. Come back, he yelled. But the fire inside of him instantly went out. She was crying. Lil was crying. Two hours later, Montana stood in front of Lil's townhome. It was older and small, but quaint and well taken care of. He banged on the door. He figured he didn't have to fake niceties with her. No answer. He knew she was there. The P.I. he'd hired before he'd even got to Billings still had eyes on her. He felt guilty about watching her, but he had to. He banged again. He heard someone moving to the door, and his heart thudded like a caged bird inside his chest. The report said she'd been dating a partner at the firm, the one Charity told him she was with at lunch today. If a man answered the door, he didn't know how he would handle that scenario. It was pushing his ego to think he'd have to deal with another love interest. Flinging back the door, Lily wore complete black spandex and was holding a yoga mat. Her blonde hair fell in light curls around her shoulders. She rolled her eyes. What are you doing here? Seeing her in all that spandex made him feel completely tongue-tied. The same way he'd felt that first day he'd met her at the swimming hole. He was speechless. She was beautiful. He got lost in her blue eyes. He'd spent far too many hours thinking about them. What? she demanded. Rocking back on his heels, he gave her the rock and roll smile he'd trained himself to give whenever he was nervous. Do you realize who you're talking to? A slight grin of annoyance filled her face. Oh, you mean the king of country music? Exasperated, he glared back at her. Not the way I would have said it. Giving him an irritated eye roll, she flashed him a grin. Well, you're not my king. She threw the door shut. Completely stunned, he realized he hadn't been treated like this in a long time. This was incredible. Did she know how many people wanted one-on-one -on -one time with him every day? Did she know people actually paid for one-on-one -on -one time with him? Hearing a garage door open, he saw her Camry pulling out. He realized she must be going to yoga. Sneaking up on the car, he went to the passenger side and yanked open the door as she started forward. Shocked, she hit the brakes. What are you doing? Slipping in, he slammed the door shut. Getting you to talk to me. Jumping in the car is a tactic one of my stalkers used on me once. Frowning, she pinched her lips and took off. Oh, right, because you're a big star and everyone loves you. She sped at a more than comfortable speed for Montana. How fast are you going? This is a residential area. Locking the gear into position, she grinned. You can always jump out if you want. He flashed back to a memory of them when they were 16 in Jason's truck, and he was teaching her how to drive a stick shift. Unwillingly, he laughed, and their eyes met. Then she frowned. No, I'm not thinking about that stupid old truck of Jason's. He couldn't stop the smile that lit up his face. She scowled at him. What do you want, Montana? Holding on for dear life, he tried to focus on the task at hand. The note Jason left. Her face went completely blank. Do you know what the note said? And a stop sign, Lily took a hard right. Nope. She put the car into gear and kicked up the speed, heading on to the interstate. You have no idea. I knew there was a key. I didn't even think about a note. Montana didn't have time for this. It said you were mad at me and I should come to you. She kept her eyes focused on the road and let out a breath. Well, guess you wasted your time because I don't care a fig about you. Her phone chimed in the cup holder and she ignored it. Montana kept his eyes on her. She flung a look at him. Why are you here? He gave in. I know you lived in Denver for a year, then came back here for school. But I'm confused, because the picture the investigator brought back showed Jason was with you. Did you live together in Denver, then break up? 
Her phone chimed again. He saw surprise on her face. She bit down on her lip and looked away, letting out a rippling laugh. He never lived with me. If he was there, he must have been visiting. Because he was my friend. The kind of friend that visits and calls and checks in with you. The dig smarted more than Montana thought it should. What else did your investigator tell you? Her voice was icy. A third time, her phone chimed. Lil. This wasn't going the way he wanted it to go. He needed answers. Don't call me that. This was unbelievable. Why? She took an exit and got off the freeway. I'm not Lil. I'm L.R. Gold, attorney at law. He couldn't help laughing a bit at the hoity-toity way she'd said it. You think I'm full of myself? Pulling into a parking lot next to a building with a neon yoga sign, she jerked into the spot. She spun on him after yanking her keys out of the ignition. Yeah, I am full of myself. You know why? Because I did a bachelor's degree in three and a half years, worked my butt off waitressing all while working part-time at the firm. Then I took out loans and worked while going through three years of law school. So yeah, I can be full of myself. All of this while dealing with my dad's death, my mom's Alzheimer's, and going back to check in on Jason. She pushed him hard in the shoulder. You left. You left us all. You didn't ask me what happened when you caught me kissing him. Not once. Tears burned into her eyes. She nodded, then swiped at her eyes and reached in the back for her yoga mat. So, Mr. King of Country, stay out of my life. All her emotion hit him like a ton of bricks. For a second, he didn't know what to say. And your secret? What? Shoving the door open, she got out and then waited, bending down. Jason said you should tell me your secret. If smoke could have come out of her ears at this moment, it would have. She shook her head. I don't know what he's talking about. Obviously, it's not a touchy subject. He scoffed. Narrowing her eyes, her face went to a smooth calm. It was probably the attorney face she used in court, he surmised. If you want to talk to someone, get back to Cindy and Frank and pay your respects. You should be ashamed for leaving them. They loved you like a son. I wasn't their son, Montana snapped. Her phone chimed again. He yanked it out of the cup holder and glanced at the screen. Your boyfriend's persistent, isn't he? She ripped the phone out of his hand and her eyes widened. How? She sputtered. Your assistant is chatty. She told me all about you and Brad, about how she thinks you need to take more time off and how devoted you are to your work. She looked even more upset. For some reason, he had to tell her before she stomped off and he never had the chance. I think what you do is cool, Lil. I'm proud of you. Pointing a finger in his face, she scowled. How dare you think I want or need your approval? She let out an angry sigh. This conversation is over. I expect you'll be able to catch a ride back to wherever you've been the last eight years. Montana watched her stalk away from the car and wished he'd been given a choice between a switch or a good talking to because he would have chosen a switch. It would have hurt less. He watched her walk into the studio. Through the front window, he saw her put her mat down and roll it out. For a brief moment, she looked out the window and directly into his eyes. That was her mistake. If she hadn't looked at him, if he hadn't felt the palpable chemistry that had always been between them, he might have been able to leave her alone. The interaction was a double-edged sword as painful as cutting open a scar, and as happy as a dream come true. Lily Ray Gold had opened the door between them. For better or worse, he'd just walked right through it. Chapter 6 The next morning, Lily got up, ran on her treadmill for half an hour, and turned on the news. Brad hadn't come over last night, texting her and letting her know he had to work late on a case. 
She wanted to tell him he didn't need to let her know he wasn't stopping over. They weren't at that point in the relationship yet. But Brad had made it clear he wanted to be at that point. Pounding into the third mile, she tried to pay attention to the news. But her mind wouldn't focus. All she could see was the awful, annoying dimple in Montana's right cheek. His coal-black hair had hung into his piercing green eyes when he'd ducked into her car and taken off his hat. Slamming the stop button, she got off the treadmill and went to the shower. Relief. Yes. She needed steaming hot water to sear the memories out of her. Her mind drifted, but she stopped it. Why had Jason mentioned a secret at all? Tears of frustration fell down her cheeks. Why was Montana here? Why had he sat in her car for most of the class and stared at her doing her yoga before walking away a phone to his ear? It was creepy, and she would have called the police, except... Would anyone believe Montana Crew was actually stalking her? She slammed off the hot water, moving it to cold, letting it freeze her, forcing the pain out of her. Only one other person knew her secret, and he was dead now. He'd been the only one she'd trusted, and he'd been true to his word, except for this little beyond-the-grave stunt. Anger surged inside of her. Strike that. Of course Jason had forced the issue. He'd been forcing it for eight years. Now there was this niggling feeling her secret wasn't really safe. She'd agreed to give Montana the envelope because Jason wouldn't let it drop. Every time she'd stopped in to see him after visiting her mother, he asked her. Until finally she'd agreed. He'd never forced her, never threatened. No, Jason wasn't like that. He'd never been like that. Okay, only once. There was only one time he'd ever forced anything, and Montana had walked in on them. Grabbing a towel, she quickly dried off. Why did she have to take the stupid key to Montana? Why had Montana come here? Thirty minutes later, she pulled into work. She'd gotten there at seven, which was her normal time. She didn't have a husband or family, so she demanded more of herself. The partners knew they could count on her putting in long hours when she needed to. Sunday was the only day she didn't work. Sunday was for Mama. Taking the service elevator up, she drank coffee from her metal thermostyle cup. She didn't believe in wasting money at coffee shops. Her one indulgence had been buying her townhome last year. Everything else went to student loans or into savings. Getting off on the third floor, she went to her office and promptly buried herself in the files Charity had left on her desk. She organized the files according to the deadlines of most importance. Everything for her meeting with Brad was ready. The strategy for Jared Carter's case was rock solid. Brad walked in at eight on the dot, a grimace on his face. Brad? She stood. What's wrong? Sit. He put up a commanding hand. Can we have a talk? Hesitating for a moment, she went to the couch and sat. Brad sat next to her, adjusting the knot of his tie. He did this when he was nervous. Tell me what's wrong, she demanded. Squeezing the bridge of his nose, he sat back, tugging his hand back and letting out a breath. Montana Cruz people contacted Harrington. At the mention of Montana's name, anger lit a fire inside of her. She couldn't even speak trying to keep her public image in place. Harrington was the top dog partner. The damage he could do with his little stunts could be irreparable to her career. Montana Crew wants to retain our services. Her anger deflated into confusion. The partners convened a meeting last night where it was decided we would take Mr. Crew on as a client. What? It's done. Brad waved a hand through the air. Mr. Crew wants to hire the firm to help him with some legal matters concerning Mr. Jason Given and his last wishes. He wants you to be the direct link between us and him. No. She jerked to a standing position and then sat back down. She knew her face was bright red, and she had to put her hands together to prevent them from shaking. Respectfully, this has nothing to do with our firm, and I can't be the point person. I... 
just can't. Pausing for a few beats, Brad put his hand to his chin, seeming to evaluate the facts before him. I don't like this any more than you do, Lily. Please, Brad, go back and talk to them. He sniffed and shook his head. I wish I could tell you we can refuse Mr. Crew's business, but we can't. He's, well, you must know getting him as a client is a huge boon for our firm. In fact, he's agreed to use us exclusively in Montana for personal and public work. It's kind of exciting, actually. This caliber of client will change things for us. Holding his gaze, a blur of emotion washed through her. I can't believe you. Glancing down, he released a breath. It's not my choice. Completely confused by Brad, she shook her head. Fine, I quit. Her mind was already going to the other firms she could call and get on with. She was good at her job, and she'd had multiple offers. Brad cleared his throat. The partners thought you might say that. She wagged her finger at him. I don't have a non-compete clause that includes being forced to be an indentured servant to an old boyfriend. Brad moved forward, taking her shoulders. Lily, listen. They have agreed to put your name on the door and pay off your loans if you do this. He wants your personal services for 30 days. That's all. He's paying a huge retainer fee. Huge. No! Lily shouted, tears of frustration surfacing. Get your hands off me! She went to the window. Lily, do you know how much pro bono work we could do for abused and abandoned children and mothers if we take on this work? Brad was beside her. Stunned, shocked, horrified. She could imagine what kind of numbers Montana had thrown at them to get them to this point. Instantly, they were offering her a partnership, willing to pay off her loans, and Brad was dangling pro bono cases in front of her. Swinging to face him, she asked, what did they offer you? He blinked, but didn't give anything away. He shook his head. Can we focus on what's important? She was already focused on Montana. Without warning, she laughed, thinking of the foster kid. The foster kid with nothing. Nothing. Now he was acting like the spoiled, bratty prince who'd come back for the kingdom. Lily? A million thoughts whirled through her mind. If Montana pursued this, which he obviously would, he'd find out what she didn't want him to find out. Her secret. Sudden sadness pierced into her chest. She blinked. He didn't want her. He wanted the truth. And she couldn't let him have it. So what's your answer? His voice was soft. Not looking at him, she let out a sigh. I guess it doesn't matter what dollar sign they offered you. Obviously, you took it. That's not fair. She moved to her desk. What, you're going to point out I have a price of my own? She rummaged through some files. Loans paid, named partner. Sounded pretty good to her. So what if she had to go with Montana? Even better, this way she'd be able to throw him completely off the trail. She took the one file she couldn't let go to chance. I'll do it on the condition I come back for Jared's trial in a few days. Brad was still at the window. He didn't speak. She turned to him. I mean it. I have to finish this child's case. His face was sad. He tilted his head to the side. You know, you don't have to do work for Mr. Crew. They would be mad, but I would figure out something to tell them. Warmth surged through her. For a moment, she recognized the reason she did have feelings for Brad. Because even though he was an attorney through and through, he had these flashes of bravery she'd seen in the courtroom. No, I'll do it. A flicker of a smile tugged at her lips. But she wasn't about to grant him forgiveness so easily. But I come back for the Carter case. That's my condition. Lifting an eyebrow, he let out a breath. You're not mad at me? Yes, I'm mad, she fired back. He frowned. You're mad at me? Yes. She went to him and plunked the file into his hand. I'm counting on you to make sure everything falls perfectly into place. He let out a reluctant laugh. I do always know where I stand with you, don't I? 
He said it softly and closed the gap between them, reaching for her hand. Even though she let him take her hand, she stepped away, unwilling to meet his eyes. She was embarrassed for feeling upset he hadn't fought more for her. It was stupid. She knew it. The feeling kind of surprised her, too. Lily, he pleaded, trying to get closer. She took another step back and dropped his hand. Don't. But he was fast, pulling her into him tightly. Think of all the people we'll be able to help. Knowing him, knowing he wasn't the kind of man to force anything on her, she relaxed. I know. He let out a low groan. But you'll have to spend a month with him. Shoving his face into her neck, he groaned even louder. Happy he was getting tortured too, she sighed. The idea of keeping Montana away from her secret appealed to her more and more. It'll be fine, don't worry. Plus, I'll be back next week for the Carter case. Brad sighed, looking truly upset. I'm sorry. The warrior after losing the battle. Lightly, she brushed her lips to his. Don't worry, it'll be fine, I have a plan. Cocking an eyebrow, he gave her a confused look. This doesn't sound good at all, Lily. Pulling Brad into one more hug, she smiled. Montana had no idea what bug-infested pack of crackers he'd just opened. She'd make him pay for extorting her to get his way. And she'd make him pay for leaving. Chapter 7 Montana waited outside of Lily's house the next morning. His heart was racing, and his palms were as sweaty as they'd been on their first date. He was 26, not 16. Not to mention he'd had to buy off her firm to get her help. This wasn't a fun thing. As far as he was concerned, this was business. That's all. Only a business deal. He wouldn't admit he'd finally pinned down what he was feeling as he tossed and turned last night, staring up at the 1970s popcorn ceiling at the hotel. Excitement. Attraction. Everything he'd felt the first time he'd taken her out. But more. Intensified. By anger. By pain. By the past. He sat on his motorcycle, knowing she'd be angry when he told her his plan. He didn't care. She'd have to deal with it. Still, she'd be angry. It made him think of the first time he'd been to her home. Montana knocked on the door, and Lily Ray's mother answered, frowning at him. The whole town knew he was some foster kid the Givens had taken in, and the town was small. They didn't like new things or new people. Well, everyone except for the Given family and Lily. Lily's mother frowned at him and then turned and yelled over her shoulder. Lily! Her father threw the door back. He wore a white wife-beater shirt. A cigarette dangled from his mouth. He scowled even more deeply than her mother. I don't know you, boy. Montana wanted to skitter off like a frightened mouse, but he managed to stick his hand out. I'm Montana Crew. Pleased to meet you. Lily bounced out in front of them, kissing her mama's cheek. It's fine, Daddy. Love you guys. See you soon. Where everything else was black and white, she was color, from her bright hair to her bold red lipstick. Lacing her arm with his, she propelled them down the deck steps into the motorcycle dirt bike the Givens had let him use. Her father yelled after them. You break your curfew, there'll be hell to pay. They took off on the motorcycle, and she hugged him tight and hollered, Faster! Get me away from there! Kicking it into gear, he took them off fast. He loved the way she threw back her head and hooted and hollered. It was the best day of his life. They went for burgers, and she prattled on and on about the gossip in Springs Hollow, about her friends, about her plans to be an attorney, get paid a big fat paycheck, buy whatever clothes she wanted, and take down corporations that were evil in the process. After they finished their burgers, she smiled at him and asked, Aren't you going to kiss me, Montana? Jason hadn't been happy they'd gone out, and Jason had told him, 
as a parting shot, she'd kissed a lot of guys. Montana had asked, has she kissed you? Jason had responded by trying to punch him. Montana evaluated her sitting there with her blue eyes happy, challenging. Then he noticed a brown bruise on her collar. Reaching out, he gently grazed it. What happened? He wanted to pull the shirt back from her neck and get a better look, but he didn't. Swiping at his hand, Lily stood. Ignore it. He stood too, picking up their trash. No. She rushed out, going straight for the motorcycle. Come on, let's go. The begging way she looked at him made him do what she wanted. He got on and she climbed on behind him. He took off. Go to the water tower, she commanded. Five minutes later, they climbed to the top. She grinned up at him and closed her eyes. I'm ready. Suddenly, he was nervous. How many guys have you kissed? He asked cautiously. She playfully smacked him. Putting his hand to his cheek, he stared back her wide grin. What was that for? For questioning my morals. I wasn't questioning your morals. Then, without hesitation, she put her hands around his neck and pulled him into her. When their lips met, it was like the 4th of July and Christmas all rolled up into one. Fire and magic. Even though his face hurt, and he thought she might very well be insane, he didn't mind the kissing one bit. When they finished, she grinned back at him, her lipstick all smudged. You're my first kiss, Montana crew. What do you think? Am I any good? Now, staring up at her house, his heart raced just like that night. He felt like that day could have been yesterday, or two seconds ago. It was strange, he thought, the passing of time. Leaning to the side, he slowly got off the Harley Davidson. It wasn't that Montana wanted to be flashy with his money, but he bought what he wanted now. He could afford it, so why shouldn't he? He arranged his bike. Then he went to her front door and knocked softly. Immediately, she flung the door open, and he wondered if she'd been right there waiting for him. For a second, their gazes locked, and then her eyes went past him to the motorcycle. She rolled her eyes and handed him her duffel bag. I thought you might pull something like this. Chapter 8 Lily could hardly stand the thought of getting on the hog with Montana. Wasn't it humiliating enough she had to be his personal whatever? Brad hadn't nailed it down, just told her that she would start by assisting him with clearing up the key situation. By the time she'd left work yesterday, she understood she was basically the king's assistant. Right, not gonna happen. Just so you know, I have to be let out of my cage for a few days next week to finish a case I've been working on. Montana frowned and shrugged. That's fine. Glaring at him, she shook her head. Secondly, just so you know, I'll be helpful, but don't think I'm your personal assistant. So fetch your own coffee. She hesitated, shaking her head, still unable to believe the position she was in. I'll meet you at the bike in a second. She threw the door shut and sucked in a deep breath. Not being bothered by Montana was going to be hard. She thought of the missing hat, the way his hair hung into his beautiful green eyes, the snugness of his white shirt and his fitted jeans. Did he have to look so good? Really? Montana might have been timid and shy when she'd first met him, but now, if the man's name was any indication of the size of his ego... She thought maybe he should have been named Texas. How was she going to do this? When she'd smelled him, she'd gotten dizzy for heaven's sake. Control yourself. Focus on what you want. Don't think about the past. Focus on the task at hand. The key. Find out where the stupid key came from. Breathe. She sucked in two long breaths, went to the powder room one more time, and gave herself a good once-over. She was wearing jeans and black boots, a red shirt that made her blonde hair look more arresting, and her black leather jacket. 
Annoyed that she was scrutinizing her appearance so much, she hurried through her house, looking for lights left on or anything out of place. Then she rushed back, opened the door, pulled it shut, and locked it. When she turned back, he was already on the bike, his legs holding it up. He thrust a helmet at her. No thanks. She was making a statement that she didn't do what he said. He laughed and turned. The smell of his aftershave assaulted her, and she thought she might go weak in the knees again. You never make things easy for people you don't like, do you, Lil? Getting on behind him, she did the impossible, balancing herself while trying not to touch him. He pushed the helmet at her. Put it on, or I'll call your firm and tell them I'm reneging on our arrangement. Anger coursed through her. She took the helmet. Oh, so you're going to go to your mom every time I'm not obedient? Turning back, those green eyes met hers, and the same shiver she'd felt the day she met him went through her. It was like she was 16 all over again, and the power of his new kid smell wouldn't release her. That analogy falls deaf to someone like me. She remembered his mom had left when he was young. Very young. He didn't even remember her, not really. But she wouldn't buy into the poor foster kid act like she had all those years ago. Everyone has a sad story, she said in a bored tone. He didn't look back, but she could feel him tense. Yes, they do. He started the bike and stuffed a helmet on his own head. Slowly, he edged away from the sidewalk. You better hold on tighter than that. She was surprised to hear his words in her ears. Then she realized it was all hooked into the helmets. Shut up. He laughed, a deep tenor laugh. It was deeper than it had been in high school. Fuller. More like the man he'd become. Unfortunately, she liked it. How do I turn off the communication? Montana didn't answer. He simply took the turn onto the freeway and kicked up the speed. Grabbing tighter, she let out a little yelp. She was surrounded by his laughter again. Not wanting to be here, but having no choice, she put her arms around Montana's waist and held tight. Even after eight years, the proximity was as familiar as lying down on her pillow at night. Lily. Lily. Loud whispers. She lay in bed and her eyes flashed open. She jumped up and tiptoed to the window and then giggled. Montana and Jason stood beneath the window, the moonlight shining down on their hidden bodies next to the big oak tree. Without giving it a second thought, she unlocked the window and shimmied easily down the piping. Montana and Jason helped her down, but not before she scraped the side of her elbow. Blood instantly sprang out and ran down her arm. Ah, she said softly, trying to blot it with her hand. Montana pulled her arm to him, evaluating it. Then he reached down and picked up a leaf, using it to blot the scrape. It's okay. He gently kissed it. The thrill of his touch sent sensations of giddiness through her. He winked at her. You all right? She nodded and they scurried off. They were ecstatic and happy and free and nervous. They ran through the trees until they got the motorcycles. She hopped on behind Montana and they raced through the woods. The junior class had a return to school bonfire, always in secret, always in the middle of the night by the reservoir. They sat with the other 20 kids in the class, laughing and joking and telling ghost stories. Before the party broke up, Montana nodded to the bike and she went with him, pulling away from the group, hopping on behind Montana, and becoming one. Moonlight lit the sky, and she didn't know how long they rode, but she loved the feel of him, his hard muscles beneath his t-shirt, the way they'd both adjust their weight from side to side when they curved around something. To her, motorcycles meant more than hanging out with friends or flying down back roads. She got to be one with him freed from the normalcy of life, together. Right before dawn, he took her home and kissed her. She clung to him, putting her lips in perfect rhythm with his. 
loving the way he paused and pulled her back and smiled wide and said, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. All she knew was she wanted to kiss him for the rest of her life. Less than an hour after leaving Billings, Montana pulled into Springs Hollow. He slowed in front of the motel, the only motel in town. When they got off the motorcycle, she handed him the helmet. I don't know what you need, but when I come to Springs Hollow, I see my mama first. I'll be at the care center. Your mama's in the care center? She paused and turned back. The average lifespan of Alzheimer's patients is five years. In her sane moments, she refuses to leave Springs Hollow, unlike some people who couldn't get away fast enough. She didn't know why, but it felt good to see the way he flinched. Part of her just wanted to hurt him, the same way he'd hurt her. Chapter 9 When Lily thrust the helmet into Montana's arms and stalked off, he wanted to throw himself after her and apologize for not knowing about her parents. She'd mentioned it yesterday, her dad dead, her mother out of her mind. He'd been so consumed with her he hadn't even thought about where her mama was. Something inside of him started to tremble, as he'd shot past the Springs Hollow Town sign. He hadn't been back since the day he'd ridden off into the sunset, as Lily had so eloquently put it. Maybe coming back was a bad idea. There weren't a lot of things Montana regretted in his life. In fact, as he propped the motorcycle and got off, situating the helmets, he was certain all his regrets resided somewhere in this town. He thought of Cindy and Frank Given, and a whole storm of regret pummeled into him. He watched Lily go toward the care center, and the rest of the regret settled into his stomach. He felt sick. Thinking about Jason on top of it was too much. First things first. He'd get checked into the motel and then get on with everything. He didn't know how long it would take to do what needed to be done with the key, but he realized... There was a lot more to take care of than he'd originally thought. He accepted that. In fact, it was the whole reason he'd extorted Lil into having to face it with him, because he didn't know if he could face it all alone. Her comment about fetching the coffee smarted a bit. No, he didn't think of her as a personal assistant, but there was no way to get her to come without throwing around his money. Staring at the clean but weathered motel, he crossed to the front office. Thirty minutes later, he strolled into the care center. He took his cowboy hat off and nodded at the care workers. Within seconds, he could feel some of the workers gathering and talking. He was used to it, to being recognized. Here, it felt different. He decided he didn't want to just wait around. Going to the nurse's station, he asked, Could I have Sharon Gold's room number? A nurse with short red hair and glasses grinned at him. Montana crew? She rushed around the counter, her bracelets jingling up her arm. Do you remember me? I was two years younger than you in school, but I am your biggest fan. I've followed your career since your first album, Love on a Prayer. She sighed and hugged him. A bit uncomfortable, but willing to endure, he gently patted her. Yeah, I remember that red hair. Who could forget? Pulling back, she frowned. The amount of visible blue eyeshadow grew with her scowl. I didn't have red hair in high school. He laughed, a bit embarrassed. This is what he got for being nice. Right, I guess I'm thinking of someone else. Sorry. Without missing a beat, she pulled a permanent marker off the counter and put out her arm. Will you sign it? It wasn't uncommon for fans to want all kinds of signatures on different parts of their bodies, but he hesitated. I'll make you a deal. I have some pictures back at the motel. I'll drop one off tomorrow for you. She squealed and did little hops. Really? She thrust the marker into his hand. Great, but I still want your signature on my arm. He paused before taking the marker. Eloise Lincoln Rowe. You want the whole name? 
Oh yeah, my uncle is Lincoln and he'll get a hoot out of it. Twenty minutes later, after other nurses had gathered and requested various signatures, he started in the direction of Sharon's room. He thought of Lily's father, the mean jerk. Anger suddenly surged inside of him, but he pushed it away. Even though there'd never been anything he could do about Lily's father, Montana had threatened to ram his fist into him countless times over the course of their relationship. Pausing outside the room, he could hear Lily's voice. He peered through the partially open door. Lily sat on the chair, the Bible open on her lap. One hand rested on her mama's hand. Her mama was lying in the bed, her eyes closed. Lily's voice rang through the room in a quiet whisper. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew not him. Lily sat back in the chair. Montana almost went in, but he stopped when he heard her continue. I don't know why he wanted me to come with him on this, Mama. I was done with all of that a long time ago. I already made my amends with Jason. Everything was fine. Done. Everything's not done, her mother replied softly. Montana could swear he almost stopped breathing after hearing those words. I just have my own life to live, Mama. You love him. No. More tears from Lily as she took her mother's hand and put it to her cheek, closing her eyes. No, Mama. Her mother pulled her hand back. Ruth, is that you? Ruth, come into the kitchen. Montana's heart quickened. He recalled Ruth was Sharon's sister. Lily patted her mama's cheek and bent over her, kissing her head. Don't worry, Mama. Ruth is coming tomorrow. Ah, uh, Mama? Mama, is that you? Montana saw a tear on Lily's cheek and watched her wipe it away. The center of his chest tightened. Lily was good. So good. She'd always been this good. He'd just forgotten. Not to mention she had this shield, practically a force field around her now. It seemed to encase her. He thought of the other night, when she'd coolly dropped off the key, impenetrable. She was brave. There was no debating about that. Cindy and Frank Given flashed into his mind, and he realized he needed to be brave too. Turning away from the room, he decided it was time to man up and face them. Pulling up to the given property was one of the most emotional things Montana had ever done. He remembered being 16 and the social worker bringing him here. He remembered just like now how Cindy and Frank Given had both miraculously appeared on the deck porch, the one you had to climb to get up to. He'd often complained when they brought groceries home that they had to have their front door at the top of so many stairs. He also fondly remembered eating out on the deck, all of them laughing and talking, the lights that Cindy would string around the deck, the wonderful meals she would prepare. It had been perfect. It had been the healing balm for his life. The guilt increased, spreading over him like an oozing oil spill, the kind that leaks into the ocean and kills wildlife. Deserved guilt. Climbing off his bike, he stared up at his former foster parents. Grief had taken its toll on both of them. The etched wrinkles in their faces were more pronounced. Cindy's hair, always long and brown, was now gray. Cindy had tears on her face. As she opened her arms, a gulp of grief came out of her. He took the steps two at a time, pulling her into him. They both stood there, crying. Montana didn't know when Frank hugged them, but then they were all crying together, a cleansing cry. After Cindy released him, Frank dragged him back into a hug. You've finally come home. Home. The word sounded like an echo in the Grand Canyon, loud and funny to his ears. 
Montana stared at Frank. His glasses were tilted on his face, and the smell of pipe tobacco and mothball flannel clung to him. Tears filled Montana's eyes. I should have come back before now. I'm so sorry. Cindy only hugged him again. You're home. My boy is finally home. When she said that, all the years of anger and pain dissipated in an instant. Everything was peeled back, and he felt naked. Frank snorted and wiped his face. I'm glad you're here, son. So glad. They pulled him into the house, and he smelled Mexican food. Please join us. Cindy nodded to the pinewood table. It was simple, but it represented so many wonderful times in his life. He sat, and Frank got another plate from the cabinet. Cindy put her hands out, and all of them held hands while Frank prayed. All Montana could think about was her gnarled hand inside of his own. Afterwards, Cindy had tears on her face, but she picked up his plate and put a large enchilada in the middle of it. Well, as you can see, the house needs a lot of repairs. We've been working on them, but so many things have gotten in the way. The house looks great, Montana offered, knowing Cindy had always been working on the house. Frank shook his head. No, it doesn't. Jason was our handyman in the past couple of years. He trailed off. Montana hesitated before asking, Please, tell me. So they did. All about Jason. He'd worked at the coal mine. He'd been happy enough. The furniture business he was starting had taken off. But then the bone cancer got him. He'd battled, trying traditional medicine, energy therapy, naturopaths. Nothing could stop it. Montana listened and cried with them. He couldn't help wondering that if he'd known, could he have done something to stop it, thrown all his money at it? Cindy took his hand. It's okay, Montana. It was his time. We know. Montana didn't know it was his time. He'd never liked the idea that it was anyone's time. Why did a young man have to die? Why did Lily's mom suffer in the care center with the loss of her mind? When he was younger, the question was always why had his parents left him? Nothing like this had ever made sense to him. After sitting there for a few seconds, not quite sure what to say, Montana pulled out the key. Lily brought me this last week, from Jason. It had a note with it. He told me to ask you guys what it went to. Frank grinned, taking the key and examining it. The box of dreams. He let out a laugh. Suddenly Montana remembered. The box of dreams. His heart sped up. Realization dawned on him. The box never had a key on it. Frank sobered. He put one on it. Made me leave his side at the end to go get the box back to the fort. He wiped a tear. Guess now I know why. Sadness fell through him. He blinked. Cindy sniffed. Go see what our Jason left you. A bit later, as Montana pulled away from the house, he knew he had to get Lily. They were her dreams too. He sighed. It felt like his life had turned into one sad country song after another. Chapter 10 When Lily went back to the motel and realized Montana wasn't there, to say she was ticked would be like saying that it was an inconvenience to have a tsunami destroy a village. He'd brought her with him on his little goose chase and then left? She wasn't usually this impatient, but something about Montana struck every nerve inside her body and left her raw and restless. So she waited. She pulled out her laptop to finish one last thing on the Carter case. She supposed she should be grateful for having some time to work. Six hours later, she was pulled out of work by Montana's return. When he opened the door to his room, he asked, 
How'd you get in here? She snorted. Why don't you tell me why you used extortion to get me to come with you, only to leave me sitting in this motel the whole day? He moved to the little table in the room and put a brown paper bag on it. How did you get in? One of her favorite tactics as an attorney was always the element of surprise. Not like it had been a great feat, but still. Jim Wicks has never been able to resist me. For a second, Montana held her gaze. Then his lip twitched up. That's true. Wicks always taunted me about dating you, saying he would take you away when I wasn't looking. Unwillingly, she laughed at the jealous way he said it. Then she shook her hand. Guess it didn't matter. He flinched. Thanks for letting me know where you were going. She shut her laptop. He sighed and then whipped out his phone. What's your number? You mean your private investigator didn't have it? Montana didn't look up. It seems that you keep pretty tight reins on it. I could have asked your boss, but I decided to get it from you directly. Ignoring his false politeness, she rattled off the numbers. Moments later, a blip of her favorite song blared out. She looked at her phone and silenced the rest of the song. Narrowing his eyes at her, he flung a hand up in question. Seriously, you listen to his music? She grinned at another wave of jealousy and swung her legs off his bed, deciding to taunt him. Maybe he's my king of country. He sputtered. He doesn't have as many gold platinum albums as me. She put her laptop in the case and tried not to laugh. Maybe it's not about the gold platinum albums. Maybe I just like his music. He leveled her with a glare. But you don't like mine. Without missing a beat, she shrugged. I don't listen to yours. Their eyes met, and she saw the humor in them. Nice. He looked away. Lily tried not to notice how appealing he looked with his messy hair from the bike helmet and tight jeans. She shook her head, trying to clear it. You know it's creepy that you hired a PI to investigate me, right? Stalkerish? You know it's not. Even creepier, you watched me do yoga the other night. Tilting his head down, he sucked in a breath. You left me in your car. She pointed at him. You eventually got out and walked away, but first you watched me for a good 20 minutes. No, I didn't. Did too. Not, he called out. She smiled, remembering fighting with him all those years ago. He smiled back, and time stood still. You could have just called me, Montana. The air went slow and sticky between them. You could have just picked up the phone and called a long time ago. He cleared his throat, opened a plastic bag, and produced a Tupperware and a plastic spoon. Zindi sent leftovers for you. Surprised, she reached for them, tearing off the lid and inhaling like she could eat it that way. No one refused Cindy's cooking. She didn't want to ask, but she couldn't stop herself. How are they? Fine. You talked? Dang it, she didn't care, she reminded herself. We talked. I apologized for a lot of stuff. Their eyes met, and she felt that shiver again. She blocked it out and focused on eating the food. Man, Cindy is good. Yes, she is, he quickly agreed. Moving slowly into the room, he sat at the small chair next to the table. How was the funeral? Lily didn't want to tell him. He didn't deserve to know. Reluctantly, she answered. He'd been to see Cindy and Frank. That was something. The whole town was there. It was touching. You know, Father Lou talked about all that crap about life and death and how everything has a deeper meaning. You don't believe it does, Montana asked. She sighed. I don't want to get into this with you. He cleared his throat. I actually went to get you before I went to Cindy and Frank's, and I saw you reading the Bible to your mother. Lily didn't know why this made her nervous. He'd been watching her again. Montana could still put her on edge, and she didn't like it, not one bit. 
Stay out of things that aren't your business. Surrendering, he put both hands into the air. You're right, it is none of my business. He stood. They said the box for the key is at the old fort. He paused. All she could think about was that night. The last night they'd been at the fort. The night before he'd left her. He cleared his throat and she met his eyes. The air between them was tangible, filled with tension. She knew both of them were thinking the same thing. He swallowed and then looked away from her. The sun's going down. We better get going. Lily looked at the dark sky outside, a nervousness wove into the bottom of her stomach. You do remember there are ghosts in those woods. Letting out a light laugh, Montana met her eyes again. The ones in the woods aren't the ones I'm worried about. As they rode up the road to the fort, every part of her was on edge. All the visions from that night that she'd tried to block from her mind were right here. Montana turned off the engine, and she inhaled a deep breath. The smell of pine assaulted her, the same smell she'd had a distaste for since then. She could do this, get this done, get it over with, and then she could go back to her life. Montana opened one of the saddlebags. Just in case. He pulled out two big flashlights and handed one to her. When she took it, their hands brushed, and a tingle of chills washed over her. She ignored the way he affected her. She hurried and got off before moving ahead of him up the side of the mountain. Montana matched her speed, and they were hiking together. It was spring, and the trail went from gravel to muddy halfway up. I don't think I'm going to be able to use these shoes again, Lily said absentmindedly. Just have to throw them away. She grinned. Guess they'll go on the expense list. You can clean them, he grunted. Pausing, she scanned the tree line up ahead for the ford. Some things aren't worth the effort. You just put them in the trash and never look back. Montana pressed his lips together, then let out a sigh. Maybe not. The sun had gone down over the mountain. It was starting to get dark and cold. Montana pointed to the east. There it is. The fort looked smaller than she remembered, which shouldn't have surprised her. But it still looked the same in some ways. It had the wood they'd painted blue to match their high school colors, faded stenciled names of movies and old lines of poetry. Both Montana and Jason loved poetry. They had spent most of their time reading different poets from old dusty books found at the second-hand store. She stood outside of it, tears budding in her eyes as she thought of Jason. Montana stood next to her, and she saw him fiercely blinking. Okay, let's do this. She ducked in first. The rug they had put down was pretty much black. She stared at the rolled up sleeping bags, the piles of books, the tackle box and fishing poles. It appeared unchanged. Montana pushed inside and looked around. It didn't take long to find the old rusted ammo box. With the new lock on it, it sat perched on a cardboard box on the floor. Montana went for it. Lily's heart pounded into her throat. She suddenly worried about what exactly Jason had put in the box. Would Jason have gone back on his word? Fear pierced her heart. She put her hand over his. Wait. Montana looked back at her. Lil, don't call me that. His look turned to frustration. Lily? Can I look first? He scoffed and tugged away from her. No. She yanked the box out of his hands. He'd already put the key in, so she tried to wrangle it open. Then his hands were on it, pulling it back. She fell, holding it, and Montana tumbled down too. They were scrapping for it, and it turned into a messy wrestling match. She hadn't been in one of these since the last time they'd all been fighting for something in the fort. Montana was bigger and stronger and much quicker than she was. He yanked it open, and she saw another envelope. He extricated it, and then immediately stood, ripping it open. She got to her feet and tried to get it. Hand it over, please. She was almost crying now. 
and she couldn't believe she hadn't thought about what the key might reveal. But he was already reading it. Lily in Montana, if you're reading this, I'm gone. First, Lily, it's not about your secret. Simultaneously comforted and ticked off, she relaxed back and crossed her arms, stinking Jason mentioning her secret again. Montana rolled his eyes, grunted, and kept reading. I wanted you to remember what we'd all planned on doing together. I hope you do it. For me. If you don't, I hope you can both forgive me. Remember, no regrets. Lily swiftly grabbed the paper beneath the letter out of Montana's hand. This is my writing. It was from the summer before their senior year. Montana looked over her shoulder, his voice abruptly soft. That's right. I remember that night. You, Jason, and I camped out here and stayed up all night, remember? Forgetting she was supposed to be mad at him, she let out a light laugh and then turned back. You and Jason took the rest of my daddy's fireworks and set them off at midnight. She'd been sound asleep, nearly scared me to death. He laughed. She smiled, turned back to the paper, and read silently. Number one, surf on the Hawaiian Ocean. Number two, hot air balloon ride. Number three, scale Devil's Tower. Man, I guess we didn't want much, did we? He trigger laughed. She didn't laugh. For a moment, grief assaulted her again. Lil. She put up a hand. Name. Woman, I'll call you whatever I want to call you. It was almost nice to have her anger surpass the grief, and she turned on him in her righteous indignation. You act like they were trite, but we didn't have billions, remember? And he didn't... She broke off, turning away from him and stalking out of the fort. All he wanted was to get shells from Hawaii for his mother, remember? Before he died, he asked me if I ever went to Hawaii, if I would do that for him. Montana followed her, grabbing her arm. Hold up, I know what Jason was. I wasn't acting like they were tried, I was just... What? She ripped her arm away. He was biting down on his lip and tears were suddenly in his eyes. Don't you remember, Lil? Sometimes I laugh when I don't want to cry. She did remember. Sitting by him on the bank by the river, when he'd explained how he'd grown up, and why he'd ended up in foster care. His druggy mother had passed him around, and taken him back when she'd gotten clean, promising him rainbows and popsicles but it had all ended with her death when he was twelve. He'd never known his father. Never cared to find him, he'd told her. He'd left him. Wasn't that enough? Chapter 11 Montana stared at Lil and knew they had to do the list. They had to, but he didn't want to force her he gathered the ammo box and the flashlights. Let's get back to the motel. Swinging back to him, she frowned. Okay. He led the way with the flashlight. At one point, she stumbled and had to reach out and hold onto his shoulder. He wouldn't lie. It felt good to have her rely on him. They got to the motorcycle and rode back to the motel in silence. Lily held the paper in one hand and her muddy shoes in the other. As they walked up to their adjoining rooms, he put his hand out for the list. What? Lily asked. Please give me the list. Why? Because he gave me the key. She held the paper against her chest for a moment, and you could see how fragile she was and the tears that bubbled into her eyes. She gave it to him. We can't do these without Jason. Hesitating only for a second, he let out a breath. Just tell me your secret, Lil. Closing her eyes for a second, she flashed them back open and let out a light laugh, shaking her head. I cannot believe this. Secret, he pushed. 
Narrowing her eyes, she shook her head and then broke into a bigger laugh. He was kidding. She wiped beneath her eyes. You know Jason was such a kidder. She let out a whooping laugh and turned to her room door. Grabbing her forearm, he spun her back. Their eyes met. All the pent-up energy between them exploded with that touch. How much things had changed, but hadn't changed at all. Confusion and anger and all that had been lost warred within his chest. Her perfect lips were right there, inches away. Could he just kiss her? But he wasn't 16, and he wasn't totally controlled by his hormones. Bill, don't mess with me. He mentioned it once in this letter and once in the letter with the key. It must be important. Lily ripped her hand back like she'd been burned, scorched by a ball of fire and needed emergency care. Her eyes were wide, skittish. She threw the list on the floor and rushed to her motel room door, fumbling with the lock. Then she turned back. I don't care if you buy the whole dang firm. You can't extort me anymore. I quit. Montana stared at the slam door for a few moments. His heart raced, and his face was flushed. Slowly, he bent and picked up the list. He took it back to his room and placed it lightly on the table next to Cindy's Tupperware dish. With great care, he sat and smoothed out the paper. It was Lily's writing, her broken cursive. He thought of her writing it, thought of the fireworks waking her up, and her ferocity as she'd come out of the fort mad and fierce. Thinking back, that night should have been an indication as to how much Jason liked her. He'd told Montana how pretty she was, how peacefully she was sleeping when they were prepping the fireworks. But Montana's mind had been foggy. He'd been sleeping when Jason had woken him. Instead of the rage that always took him by force when he thought of Jason, he was left with regret, guilt. If he had stayed, maybe things would have been different. He'd felt so justified in leaving. Now he didn't know anything. His mind was running in overdrive. Too much had happened in the past few days. He leaned back. All he wanted to do at this moment was get in bed and get some sleep. He thought of Lil and then made a decision. Picking up his cell phone, he pressed Kirk's number. Sup, boss? Well, you know I'm in Springs Hollow. That sounds like a country song. Montana let out a sigh. Yep, it could be. Look, I need you to do something for me. Okay. I need you to book two tickets to Hawaii for tomorrow morning around 11. Even better, schedule the jet. If it's unavailable, book first class tickets. Sweet, two nights, right? Been flying to Vegas for the show? Of course. He had fans counting on him. It was a big commitment. Those people had spent hard-earned money to see him perform. I'll be there. Kirk hesitated. You okay, boss? Are you a betting man, Kirk? What? Montana laughed, thinking of Lily and wondering what she'd choose. I'm going to give someone a bet and see what she chooses. I don't understand. I know. Thanks, Kirk. Getting off the phone, Montana went to Lily's door and banged on it, not bothering to knock softly. Nothing. He tried again. Nothing. Reaching out, he turned the doorknob. The door opened. What in the heck was she doing leaving the door unlocked? The room was empty, but her duffel bag was there. He inched forward, inhaling the light lemony scent she'd left behind. Through the window, he saw the care center and wondered if she'd gone there. Did they allow visitors this late at night? Where else could she possibly go? If it were eight years earlier, where would she go? He raced back in his room, slipped on his boots, and rushed down to his bike. Ten minutes later, he was coming up on the water tower, and he caught a glimpse of her red shirt and sandaled feet hanging over the side. The tennis shoes she'd been wearing must be in the trash, he thought. Parking the bike, 
He made his way to the ladder and climbed quickly. When he got to the top, she was staring at the ground. Just go away, Montana. Her voice wasn't mean or firm like it had been. The words were a soft plea. He moved next to her, copying her position. They sat there, breathing the scent of pine and the rust of the water tower. He fought the memories of coming here every time they wanted to get away from Jason or the rest of their friends and make out. Jason knew we'd come here to make out. Did you know that? He didn't look at her. No. Clicking her tongue, she sighed. Yep. She pointed down by some trees. He would stand over there and watch us. Annoyance flashed through him. He took his privacy seriously these days, but he'd never liked being watched. Why? She sighed. Because he liked me? He liked me, Montana. That day, the day we were leaving for Vegas, in some tacky chapel with an Elvis impersonating priest, he told me he liked me. Then he kissed me. I was waiting for you, and he came out, and before I could stop him, he told me he watched us kiss. Then he pulled me in and kissed me. It had been almost eight years ago, but at this moment it felt like Montana was living it. He clutched his hands into fists. Surprising him, Lily threw back her head and laughed. Oh, Montana, you're getting all tense. That's funny. Looking back, Jason liked me my whole life. In reality, you stole me away from him. At least, that's how he looked at it. She sighed. He told me he was desperate when he found out we were leaving. He thought he'd have a chance at some point to tell me his feelings. A chance to make it work. But he knew he messed up. He loved you. Loved you like a brother. She paused. When you moved to town, Jason didn't have a chance. Her mentioning it made it real again. Montana turned to look at her. It was an instant for us. Her tears glistened. It was over for me when we were together. We laughed, joked. We were inseparable, like two magnets. She drew in a ragged breath. It was all back between them. The chemistry. He couldn't stop himself from adjusting his position and staring at her perfect face, her perfect lips, the shine of her hair. She was gorgeous. Her face had tortured him for eight years, and now he was getting lost in her lemon scent. She'd stopped talking and was staring at his lips. He leaned in. Pausing for a split second, she let out a breath, and then her lips were on his. He moved closer. She was exactly what she'd said, a magnet to him. Their lips were in sync. His hands pushed through that soft hair. All the memories, all the needs circled him, surrounded him like the hurricane it had always been with Lil, and he was getting swallowed up. The storm ceased an instant later as Lily pulled back. Her hands were on his chest and her breath gasping. She laughed. Then she threw her head back and laughed more. It was wonderful, beautiful, breathtaking. She looked exactly as she had at 16. And for a second, Montana felt lost in time. Was it then or now? Untangling herself from him, she stood. He stood too. Gently, she put a hand to his cheek. He put his over hers. Tears washed over her face. I don't know how that always happens with you, Montana. Little shakes of his head. I know how. Magnets. More tears from Lil made his heart hurt. Isn't that a good thing, Lil? She sighed and took a step back from him. I don't know if it was ever a good thing. It hurt Jason. She paused. It hurt me. She looked away. When you left, I had nothing. Montana felt like he'd been gut-punched. 
she started for the ladder, a derisive laugh escaping. The funny thing is that Jason loved me. He stayed with me. He tried to take care of me. She started down the ladder. Even though I never loved him, she sighed. It's just sad. When they got down, Montana followed her, moving in front of her path to stop her. You can't leave things unfinished anymore, Lil. He took her hand. Taking her hand back, she sighed. Jason had to leave a lot of things unfinished. Life's not fair. I know, I'm sorry, he added quickly. He was. For the first time since he understood it better, he was sorry. Lily turned to him and gave him a sad smile. Montana, you're sorry, I'm sorry. I guess Jason got what he wanted for us. We were all forgiven. Jason was a good person, better than me, that's for sure. She started to walk away. It's over now. Wait, she kept walking. Now I have to tell my boyfriend I kissed you. He followed her. I'll give you a ride back. She waited by the bike, looking defeated. Fine. She looked away. I kept the stupid shoes, put them in the sink at the motel to soak. So there's a chance with you for things that get ruined? She let out another sigh. Just don't, Montana. All he wanted to do was surround her, protect her, keep her close to him. This strong, bullheaded girl, now a woman, who had worked so hard and accomplished so much on her own. He wanted to be her rock. He'd always wanted that if he really thought about it. The hurt had made him feel stupid, immature, spurned. He stared at her without getting on the bike, wanting to tell her, wanting to change things. Montana, you're just caught up in a moment in the past. She looked up at the tower, then back to him. It was a good moment, but we have to move on. We're not 16 anymore. That wasn't the answer he wanted. I want to do the list with you. She hesitated. Then he did what he knew he should do. What the mature version of himself would do. The person that didn't demand things or spurn things the person that had gone through hard things with his first wife and learned that people wouldn't always give you your way and that God sometimes took the most important things from you, ripped them away. Montana no longer had a desire to throw the important things away. I'm releasing you, Lil. What? She looked confused. I'll give your firm my business. I'll pay what I agreed to pay. And if you want, you can go back to Billings and back to your life. That's fine. Are you serious? Her pale eyes lit with the moonlight, and she looked wonderstruck. He nodded. I'm doing the list. I've booked two tickets to Hawaii tomorrow. He hesitated, because this idea had been churning around in his brain. Do it with me. For Jason, he swallowed, pushing back the emotion. For ourselves, to finish it. He didn't want her to say no yet. He knew she wasn't ready to say yes, though. So he got on the motorcycle and waited. Think about it. You can let me know in the morning. I promise not to ask again about your secret. He cleared his throat. You can tell your boyfriend the kiss was simply closure. Getting on the bike, he felt her arms go around him. Then he felt her head against his back. If that kiss was just closure, then I don't think I could take a real second chance kiss, she confessed. Chapter 12 Lily lay in her motel bed. Montana was a whole room over but it was like she could feel his energy, his restlessness. She tried to close her eyes and think about something else. She pulled out case files in her brain and looked over each one, thinking about strategy or things she needed to tell Charity. 
Picking up her phone, she saw three missed calls from Brad and five texts, but she ignored them. Part of her was hurt. There were no two ways around it. Brad wanted to line his pocketbook more than he cared if she went with her old boyfriend. Another part of her didn't want to answer the hard questions she knew Brad couldn't help but ask. So, at 1.30 in the morning, she called Charity. Why are you calling me? Her voice was sleepy. Because you're a snitch. What? You told Montana about me and Brad. What? I don't care, but you did. That's not fair. He asked who you were at lunch with, and he's like, totally breathtaking. I couldn't think straight. She shook her head. I have a few things for the cases. Right now? Sorry, I can't sleep. Are you with the hot guy? Now her voice sounded awake. Lily grinned. It wouldn't do to put Charity off. You know this is an assignment from the firm. Is he with you in the same room? If he is, don't say yes. Use a code word. Um, waffles. She laughed. No, he's not with me. Boo, boring. Charity, what are you doing right now? Charity was her friend as well as her assistant. Well, if Lily could say she truly had friends. They'd gone to lunch and Manny Petty's a couple of times, but Lily was always completely consumed with her work. She spent Sundays with her mom and, for the past few years, Jason. Charity wasn't just her closest friend, she was her only friend. He told me I don't have to stay with him and he'll still pay the firm. Released from servitude, pretty much. You sound hesitant. Not wanting to explain, but wanting to talk it through, she began. Jason was a friend to both of us. The one who passed from cancer? Yes. Okay. He made... Well, actually, together we all made a list of some things we wanted to do the summer before our senior year of high school. Like what? Surf in Hawaii. Oh, yeah, you should do that. It's fun. That's right. Charity had done that. What else? Balloon ride in Jackson, Wyoming. Oh, I've never done that. What else? Climb Devil's Tower. That is amazing. Hard, but amazing. I'm a guide, you know. Yeah. So are you guys going to do it? He is. You totally should. I can't. Seriously, Lily, you're being paid to hang out with the hottest guy ever, and I don't know your past, but if you're going to do all that stuff, that's like a paid vacation. Who cares about Brad? He'll recover. When Charity said it like that, it sounded different. You don't understand. Lily didn't want to think about it all, but she couldn't stop herself. The very center of her chest exploded with pain. The past rushed into her. The doctors, the adoptive parents taking her carefully out of Lily's arms. Jason holding her hand. At that moment, she knew Montana would never forgive her for giving up the baby. She would never forgive herself. Her little girl. She'd given up her little baby. And she knew that Montana crew should burn in hell. I'm sorry for waking you, Charity. I gotta go. Wait, Lily, wait. She pressed the end button. Rolling over in bed, she let the gulping sobs come out of her into the pillow. The ache, the pain, the regret. She gulped out another sob and whispered, I'm so sorry I couldn't give you a family, baby. I'm so sorry. Chapter 13 Montana got up early and went for a run, ending up at the high school. Staying by the fence, he watched the football team do drills. Coach was famous for keeping them in fighting shape even in the spring. Before he knew it, the coach was coming toward him. Montana wanted to run away, but he was stuck. He nodded to the big man with the ruddy cheeks. Coach Spark? Coach smiled. Montana crew. Boy, we've missed you around here. 
When the coach got to Montana, he put him in a big bear hug, then pushed him back and eyed him up and down, letting out a boisterous laugh. You look like you could run drills if you needed to. Montana glanced back at the teens. Need some help? Coach laughed and pounded his back. I thought I might see you at Jason's funeral. The old town wondered, but I guess... Of course, the collective voice of the town threw Coach Spark. He shrugged. Couldn't make it. Hesitating only briefly, the coach nodded. I get it. Life comes at you a million miles an hour, and by the time we slow down, it might be too late. But your family in Springs Hollow, you know that. We've been proud of you. Unwanted emotion clogged Montana's throat, and he looked away, surprised by it. He had hardly thought about the town at all. Since all of it was tied to Lily and Jason, he'd done the same thing he'd done his whole life before Springs Hollow. He put it in a box and shut it, never to be opened again. It was the only way to handle the pain of moving from home to home. But now, with Coach Sparks standing there, compassion on his face, the memories all rushed back. Coach cared. This town cared. The man was still burly and ruddy-faced, looking the same as he had eight years ago. Montana remembered he never passed up an opportunity to share life lessons. Montana couldn't help but grin. You're right, coach. You're exactly right. I don't mind saying that I wish I had come. In fact, between you and me, I wish I had done a lot of things differently. He let out a long breath. Man, it felt good to admit it. Coach nodded and nudged him in the shoulder. You're always welcome back at a hometown game. This simple invitation, this olive branch, made him smile. I'm going to hold you to that, coach. Yep. I'm making you a deal. I'll come up for a game, but I'm sending you and the wife tickets to a show in Vegas. I'll comp the rooms, dinner, and the show if you'll be my after-concert guest. The coach's eyes widened, and a large grin spread across his face. He nodded. The missus will be very happy about it, Montana. We're big fans. Montana patted the coach's back. That's what people in small towns do for each other, right? Coach nodded, and he cocked an eyebrow. You know I have to put in a plug for sponsorship. The team could use some new uniforms this year. He pointed at Montana. And I ask all past alumni for money for the team, so don't think you're special. Montana let out a soft chuckle. How about you put me down for new team uniforms this year? Really? Coach's eyes widened. You're sure? Montana snorted and whipped his phone out to text Kirk. My people will cut a check for 10000 Think that'll cover it? Yes, sir. With that much, we can get the new concussion-preventing helmets the state's been pushing us to use. Montana winked at Coach and noticed tears forming in the man's eyes. He slapped his back. I'll be at homecoming in October, so you keep these kids whipped into shape. I gotta go. You bet. Coach waved at him, looking quite pleased. You done a good thing, Montana. We won't let you down. Montana took off, but turned back to say, No, coach, I won't let you down. Getting back to the motel, Montana couldn't believe how light and free he felt. He loved this town. He remembered that now. Loved the people. Cindy and Frank. All the teachers and coaches at the school who'd accepted and loved him. He loved the community. Yes, in the future he would make this town part of his home. He'd come back, mingle with his old friends even if he'd messed up. Families forgive you. At least, the kind of family Montana had always wanted did. He was done forgetting the past. He had Jason to thank for that. He could feel himself changing. As he took the steps to the motel and back to his room, his mind was flooded with Lily. He could have sworn somewhere between one and four in the morning he'd heard something from her room. Something like crying. It was there, and then it wasn't. He'd wanted to go to her, but she didn't want him. He didn't know what she was ready for, 
but he prepared himself to walk away if he had to. It would hurt, more than he wanted to admit. He respected her, though, and he wouldn't demand she do the list with him. After all, these were his demons to work through, for Jason, for himself. He wished with every part of him he could change the way he'd treated everyone, wished he could take back the silence, but he could only change the future. As the shower pounded against him, Montana did something he hadn't done for a long time. He prayed, not just for himself, but for Lily, too. When Lily came out of the motel at eight sharp, she looked professional. Today, she wore black pants, black boots, a high ponytail, and red lipstick. His heart almost stopped. He wanted to ask if her lipstick was the same kind from high school, but he couldn't ask anything. He needed to know if she'd made her decision. She sucked in a long breath and evaluated him. Lil. She took off her Jackie O sunglasses and gave him another once-over. I'll come with you to Hawaii. Wanting to fist pump the air like the storm had just won the championship, he kept his composure. She was not Cameron Cruz, and she wouldn't appreciate the victory hooting and hollering. He spoke evenly. Okay. Lily sighed. I want you to know something. His heart thudded inside his chest. Her lips pursed together. There's no secret. Her voice was firm. Her look was severe. This must be the look she gave opposing counsel in the courtroom when she didn't want to be bugged by an issue any longer. He knew it wasn't true. He could feel it, but he didn't care. Why should they fight about it? If he hadn't known for eight years, why did it matter now? Fine. Fine. She took the acceptance quickly. And we'll have to talk more about the rest of the list. I'm not sure yet, so don't ask if I'm going to do it. I won't. And we don't need to talk about our pasts and everything that's happened in our lives. In fact, she said, seeming to be gaining speed, I think it would be better if we didn't bring the past up at all. I don't agree. What? She looked confused. Taking a step toward her to close the distance, he peered into those vibrant eyes. If you come on this trip, I want to get to know you again, Lily. He put his hand up when he saw she was about to disagree with him. Not because I want what we had, Lil. Gently, he reached out and removed a wisp of her hair that had fallen into her eyes. Because we were friends. All of us. I want that again. I won't try to extract secrets. I won't do anything you're uncomfortable with, but if you come... You treat me as your friend. I'm dating Brad. Breaking eye contact and rubbing his eyebrow, he sighed. I know. She scowled. I won't kiss you anymore either. This statement took him by surprise. He kept her hand for a second. That's fine, though. But I want to be friends. Deal? She dropped his hand. I'm not promising anything. I'm coming because of Jason, not because of you. Fine, let's go catch a plane. He blastered on a grin, hoping he could stop torturing himself by thinking about kissing her last night. It had been all he could think about since they left the water tower. At least his foot was in the door. He would take it. Chapter 14 she would be lying if she said she wasn't intimidated by the rock star life Montana lived. She was. When they got to the Billings Airport, they were immediately escorted to Montana's jet. They taxied right after boarding. As soon as the jet leveled off, a flight attendant appeared to serve drinks and snacks. Montana left her alone for most of the plane ride. Toward the end, he spoke business to his assistant on the phone. For a brief moment... She listened to him conduct business. As she peered down through the clouds at the ocean, she had to admit to herself that she was giddy, completely giddy. It was Hawaii. She wanted to gush and call charity, but she refrained. 
When they arrived on the island of Oahu, the smell of the ocean and the muggy feel in the air made her smile. They were ushered to a resort on the other side of the island in a limo. She watched the city of Honolulu rush by her and finally yield to ocean views. It was beautiful. As they got to a resort on the beach called Turtle Bay, Montana turned to her. This place is a bit older, but it has great service and is right on the beach. Digging into his wallet, he handed her a credit card. What are you doing? Cocking his head to the side, he smiled. Lil, this trip is my treat. I didn't give you time to prepare. You'll need clothes, a swimsuit, and I don't know what else. She still refused. No, I'm not some kept woman. We're on a mission. We are here for Jason. That's all. Montana shrugged and slipped the credit card into her purse. I'm still paying your firm for your time. She dug into her purse, retrieved the card, and shoved it back at him. Are you trying to make me regret my decision to come? Stop being so stubborn, woman. Do you get that I have billions of dollars? He challenged. Without anything to say, she settled for saying, Bragger. Then she dropped the credit card between them on the seat. Stunned, he released her hand and threw his head back laughing. Then he took his hat off and wiped his head. Man, I've missed you, Lil. Not understanding why Montana Crew brought out the worst part of her, she shook her head and sucked in a breath. The limo waited in line to drop them at the front doors. He laughed even harder. You just don't know what to do because usually the bimbos you hang out with never say no to a credit card. Sobering, he nodded. One correction, I don't hang out with bimbos. But yeah, if I've ever given one of my cards to a woman, they've never declined the offer. Her door opened and she got out. She'd never been to Hawaii before, and staring at the beach instead of going into the main area to check in, she really did feel like it was everything the movies had always made it out to be. The breeze smelled like pineapples. Or was it the person placing a flower lei around her neck? The lei also smelled amazing. Aloha, the beautiful dark-skinned girl said as she pulled back and kissed Lily's cheek. She held out a flowered gift bag to her. Another girl was doing the same to Montana, and he was smiling back at her. Their eyes met. Lily felt the wonder and excitement of the moment, and all the pain of the past briefly melted away. It was crazy. She was in Hawaii. She couldn't stop herself from grinning. A mischievous glint was in his eyes. What do you think, Lil? Again, unable to stop herself, she grinned back at him. I think I want to go surfing. He nodded to the bag and reached into his own. I thought we'd need swimsuits. Unable to even care he'd bought her something, she rushed into the lobby. Let's get changed. He matched her grin and took her hand. They rushed through check-in and up to their adjoining rooms. Lily was so happy. She changed into the red halter-top swimsuit and gave herself a once-over in the mirror. He knocked on her door. Are you ready? She flung the door back and rushed down the hall, not thinking about how she was here with a famous country music star. At the elevator, she pressed the down button repeatedly. It was like her very life depended on this moment doing this thing for Jason, for herself. Montana was on her heels. Dang, woman, you're in a hurry. She ignored his bare chest and the way his blue flowery swim shorts showed off his six-pack abs. Montana turned to her. Have you ever been here, Lil? Montana asked on the way down. No, have you? His eyes turned sad for a second. Then he nodded. To Hawaii, yes. But Turtle Bay, it's the first time. This made her happy. They got out of the elevator, and she took off, breaking into a full-on run when she got through the door leading to the beach. Race ya! Chapter 15 Montana was surprised that she'd gotten the jump on him, and that she even wanted to race. He let out a redneck yell and chased her. When they got closer to the ocean, he kicked it up a notch and caught up to her. Her eyes widened, 
and she let out a raging laugh as she slowed to wade into the ocean. I can't believe we're here. Her eyes trailed over him, and he felt the attraction between them. She grinned. I beat you. His eyes met hers, and the side of his lip tugged up. Unable to resist teasing her, he closed the space between them and put his hands on her hips. Whoever wins gets thrown in first. She giggled and shrieked while he picked her up and ran into the ocean, tossing her when he got waist deep. A wave showered over them, and he tasted salt water on his lips. The sun was bright, and there was barely anyone on the beach, except a few families further down with kids building sandcastles. She came up laughing and coughing, her skin glistening. Her red swimsuit accentuated her perfect curves. The waves were behind her, the sun was warm, and Lil was here. His heart could have stopped, and he would have considered himself a lucky man. Then his heart was racing, a painful racing. He wanted to say he didn't want to know her secret, that he could leave what they had in the past, but he couldn't deny he wanted her again. And the secret came with her. Everything was coming back, slamming into him like some tsunami, threatening to take over. He wasn't the boy from ten years ago, and she wasn't that girl. No, now he was a man, and she was a woman. All of his feelings were heightened and growing. The magnetic attraction she'd spoken about was more powerful than ever. They could have everything. Together. Right now. Montana held himself back. He wouldn't scare her away. It felt like they were finally breaking through the anger she had carried around since he'd seen her again. It felt like he was getting through the shield she used to protect herself. Happily, she smiled and turned to look out at the ocean. Oh my gosh, are there really turtles here? He moved next to her, scanning the shoreline. There's snorkeling gear on the beach for us. Should we go get it? Our surf lesson isn't for another hour. Yes. They started wading back to the beach, where he saw two piles of snorkeling gear. This hotel was good. This is when I need charity, she said breathlessly. Who? Montana gestured for her to sit. My assistant, the one who told you more than she should have. Right. She's a free spirit. She's way better at this kind of thing. Montana slowly shook his head. The little I knew was a free spirit, too. I remember the first time you and Jason took me out to Keystone Lake. I couldn't believe it when you just jumped off those cliffs. Then I had to jump, too. Lily laughed, and it sounded delicious. If her laugh were food, Montana would be getting second helpings. I'd forgotten about Keystone, those cliffs. You're braver than you think, Lil. Pulling her hair away from her face, she used an elastic band and pulled it into a ponytail. She didn't look at him. Brave or stupid? She asked quietly. Montana had the feeling she wasn't talking about the cliffs, but he let it go. Reaching down, he grabbed a fin and nodded to her set. Here, you put it on like this, and then you tighten the back. Lily copied him. Next, he showed her how to put her mask on and adjust it. Popping his off, he grinned. The trick to snorkeling is not freaking out when you can't breathe normally. You keep the seal tight around your nose and let your mouth do all the breathing. It's weird at first. Just remember that all the air has to go back and forth through your mouth. Looking tentative, she nodded, putting the mask in place and the tube into her mouth. Okay. Montana positioned his own, then pulled the tube out. Let's go find those sea turtles. She nodded. They began the process of scooting out into the ocean. The first time he'd come to Hawaii had been with Kim, his ex-wife. That had been five years ago. He'd been divorced for three, so it felt like forever. Even though he wasn't sure what their relationship was, being here with Lil meant everything. His heart soared. He'd take this gift, and he'd be grateful to Jason. They snorkeled to the deeper water, and he saw Lil pull up for a second. He pulled up and pulled out his tube. You okay? She laughed. I started trying to breathe with my nose. 
He laughed. Mouth, mouth. She nodded and started again. He pointed to a fish. Then he heard her making a noise, and he turned and saw another fish. Black, yellow, long. Beautiful. He loved being underwater. It was a whole new world, an unseen one. The turtle came through two large rocks. Montana tried to get Lil's attention, but she was investigating something else. So he went to her and took her hand. Jerking her head back to him, she followed where he was pointing. They swam to the turtle, and he could see Lil's wonder and excitement through the mask. He imagined his face showed the same emotions. Being this close to the sea creature was incredible. In a rookie move, she reached out and touched it. No, he shouted through the water. Confused, she went to the surface. He pulled off his mask as he emerged. You can't touch them. It could hurt them. All the wildlife can be hurt by having their natural habitat taken off of them. He should have told her this sooner. Oh, okay. They put their masks back on and went to explore some more. They showed each other every new school of fish and interesting rock or shell. It was just like when they'd first met. Chapter 16 Old memories rushed through Lily's mind. Being with Montana in Hawaii felt so normal. In the past few years, she'd kept a strong clamp on all thoughts of him, of the past. If she did think of him, she put him in the worst version of what he could be. Cocky, arrogant, unfeeling, uncaring. Going from woman to woman after his divorce. The version she'd seen touted in those stupid magazines in the grocery store line the ones she tried not to look at. Lately, she'd noticed that he'd been caught hanging out with famous football players. But now, being here and having him gesture to some underwater marvel felt surreal, like she was in a movie, but she didn't recognize the actress who was playing her. Between school, work, and her mom, Lily hadn't taken time for herself for as long as she could remember. Enjoying life had always been a later kind of thing. But here it was, later, with the man she used to love. A nervous wave pulsed through her, and she abruptly turned away from him. Brad, Brad, Brad. Tonight she would call him. They had to talk about Jared Carter anyway. Brad had people getting more interviews and was putting pressure on the maid to testify in court. Hopefully. They could get Jared into a home where he would be safe. A home that was nothing like her childhood home. Her father's face flashed into her mind. The face he'd always worn when he'd come home drunk late at night. Glassy-eyed, spittle flying when he yelled at her and her mom. Immediate fear and adrenaline spiked through her. Jared had to get away from his father. Suddenly, she realized Montana was tapping her shoulder. All her dark thoughts immediately dissipated, and dang if her heart didn't pitter-patter just like when she'd been so affected by him as a stupid teenager. They emerged out of the water and onto the beach. His eyes swept her up and down. Her red suit wasn't fancy, but she watched her diet and worked out regularly. It wasn't pride, she told herself, to feel good about the way she looked. She could see the appreciation in his eyes. The side of his lip tugged up. That was fun, right? Without trying, she couldn't help but notice his bare chest and actual abs, his slick wet hair that trailed messily into his green eyes, and his tanned skin. The lower part of her gut stirred. Yeah, Montana crew looked better than ever. Then she thought of the millions of women and girls that probably had his posters up on their walls, and she turned away. It was fun. He laughed, and she turned to him. His dimple, the one that only came out when he grinned widely, deepened. You look good, Lil. That unnerved her. We're not 16 anymore, Montana. He stopped and grabbed her forearm, holding it and pausing for a second. She tried to jerk away, but he wouldn't let her. No, Lil, we're not 16. When I was 16, I couldn't offer you anything. Her heart beat fast inside her chest. It was insane that she'd been with him for less than a day, 
and he was already getting under her skin. She turned away from him. You're not making any sense. I wanted to give you everything. His voice was soft. The whole world. She met his eyes, and emotion surged into her throat. All the hurt from years ago. I would have let you then. She looked at the ocean. Now it's too late. We grew up. Things changed. Why, Lil? Panic filled her. She couldn't ever be with Montana. It would mean facing what she'd done. We're here for Jason, she insisted. Sadness and vulnerability flitted across his face. Lil, excuse me, are you guys the ones that ordered the surf lessons? The stranger held his hand out to Montana. My name's Michael. Lily sucked in a breath and focused on the Polynesian surfer. A shell necklace hung around his neck, and he wore a flowered Hawaiian swimsuit. She let all the heaviness of the last moment go. She grinned at him. We're ready. Montana moved with her toward Michael. He glanced at her, and then Michael. Right, let's focus on why we're here. They had to do the list. Then she would get as far away from Montana crew as possible. They'd both built a life. Separately. She knew she couldn't possibly survive another relationship with Montana. And what would he think about what she'd done? Chapter 17 Montana focused on the surf instructor. It wouldn't be good for him to think about Lily next to him. It wouldn't work for him to get so distracted every time he watched her on the board. The surf instructor had been giving them a 15-minute lesson on the sand. Now put one knee on the board, Michael instructed. He was probably Montana's age, but was clearly an island boy, and a complete surfer. He'd told them he'd won the Oahu Championship last year. Like this? Montana went onto his knee where Michael had put marks on the board. Yes, good. Michael moved to Lily, who was doing the same thing as Montana. He went behind her and adjusted her hip and knee alignment. Good, Lily, you're a natural. Seeing her flash a grin at the instructor, Montana felt the heated sparks of jealousy ignite. Of course, he stayed calm. It was halfway amusing to him that it was so easy to get jealous where Lily was concerned. It hadn't taken long for all those overprotective high school feelings to kick in. He wanted to tattoo his name across her back. Yes, he knew this was ridiculous, and he let a smile play on his lips. Lily's eyes turned to him, and she grinned back, tilting her head to the side. His heart nearly stopped. He loved it when she smiled so freely. Don't laugh at me, Montana Henry. His middle name, he laughed. Hardly anyone ever called him by his middle name. In fact, he couldn't remember being called by his middle name by anyone except her. Watch yourself, Lily Ray. She laughed too, and Michael continued to tutor them. Okay, come up all the way, shift your weight to your back leg, and put your arms out. Montana liked how this Michael had taught them using some kinesiology. He'd brought a BOSU ball and was putting the surfboard on it and shaking it around to simulate the waves. Montana tried to keep his balance. The back leg, wait on the back leg, Michael commanded. When Montana shifted his weight, it worked. His balance kicked in and he was amazed. He laughed. Maybe you'll make surfers out of us yet. Michael put his board down and went to Lily. Okay, shift your weight. Montana turned to evaluate her position and couldn't stop the way her body affected him. In high school, she'd been thin, but now she was sleek. She was strong and lithe. It didn't feel like that long ago he was pulling her into him, crushing her body to his and kissing her any time he wanted. That was exactly what he wanted to do at this moment. He reminded himself he was here for Jason, like she'd said. That's all. But this secret, her secret, it kept plaguing him, coming into his thoughts randomly. What was it? What could it be? As far as he could tell, she'd lived in Denver for a year, waitressing at some dive. Then she'd gone to college in Billings and had been there ever since. Maybe she'd had to get away after everything? 
He knew how it felt to want to run. Looking back at the younger version of himself, he knew he'd acted rashly by leaving. He also knew there was more to the kiss between her and Jason than Lily admitted. It hadn't helped that Montana had doubted his ability to provide any kind of life for her. Lily's laugh rang through the air, bringing him out of his thoughts. Nice, Lily, Michael said in his deep voice. Lily giggled and looked at Michael. Thanks, you've helped so much. Michael winked at her, and once again Montana had to cool the jealous jets inside of him. Michael slid the board off of the Bosu ball and grinned. Let's get you guys out on the water. After they all paddled out, Michael pulled himself to a sitting position on his board. Remember what I taught you. When you feel me give you a push and hear me yell, you pull up to one knee and then go all the way up. Get your balance on your knee first. I'll take you out one by one and help you paddle to catch the wave. Then I'll give you a big push. Montana nodded, trying to stay focused on the task at hand and not think about how this big Hawaiian with his sleek surfing body looked at Lily. Go ahead, Lil. She nodded and began following Michael out into the surf. Michael pointed to an oncoming wave. They paddled, and then he saw it executed just as Michael had promised. Lil was up on the board, whooping and hollering. Then she turned her head to him. Their eyes met, and that thing that had always happened seared through them. Electric, wild, happy. It was the rope swing all over again. Lil pointed at him and let out a howl. Jason! Ecstatic, he pointed back at her and yelled, Jason! Then Michael was calling to him. Your turn! Montana paddled out, ignoring the fact he had all these egomaniac feelings about this surfer guy that probably had no idea he was even jealous. It was crazy and stupid and very testosterone-filled. Lily had just pointed at him and it felt amazing. Michael pointed, and they were both paddling hard to get the oncoming wave. Are you ready for this country, boy? Montana grinned. Ready or not? Michael gave him the signal. Now, up. Then Montana was soaring. The salt water in his mouth, the wind on his face, the board bucking under him. First on one knee, and then all the way up. He found Lil and pointed at her. He let out another redneck yell. She laughed, and redneck yelled back. After falling into the water, he circled back. Lil was already halfway out to Michael. Michael beamed at them. Best students ever. Let's do it again. For the rest of the afternoon, they took turns catching wave after wave, hollering and laughing and grinning. Montana was impressed with Michael. He thought it would take a lot longer for them to get the hang of it, but there they were, both surfing and having the time of their life. When Montana was exhausted, he didn't go back for another wave. After paddling back to the beach, he fell onto his back. Surfing was a workout. He sucked in big breaths of air. Before he knew it, she was next to him, falling and laughing. He turned to her and their eyes met. She had sand all over her. She was beautiful. She took his hand. Jason would have loved this. Man, he loved having her hand in his. He thought of Jason, but he thought of him when they were all 16, before all the anger and betrayal. Yeah, he would have. Montana memory clicked this moment. He never wanted to forget it. What? Nothing. Montana... She said in that mom voice he used to tease her about using on him. I miss him. He squeezed her hand. Me too. They stayed like that for a while, just staring at the ocean, feeling the warm breeze, smelling the salt water. It was perfect. She let go of his hand and leaned back onto the palms of her hands. I should probably go get some work done. Uh, no. No, I'm hungry. She smiled, looking far more relaxed than he'd seen her thus far. Me too. Have dinner with me? Please. Chapter 18 
They walked into the fancy restaurant that overlooked the ocean, and Lily felt intimidated. She hadn't brought anything super fancy to wear, and suddenly she was self-conscious in her black slacks. What? Montana inspected her. He wore black slacks, boots, a black hat, and a teal button-down silk shirt. She stopped. Nothing. All she saw were beautiful women and men in nice clothes. I can't be in here. Lil? He pushed. I don't have the right clothes, Montana. Frustration crossed his features. He sighed and reached for her hand, pulling her back through the entrance to the restaurant and through the hotel lobby. This wasn't the nice little French restaurant in Billings, Montana. She was clearly out of her element. She didn't fit into his kind of lifestyle. Why was she even thinking about it? Stopping in front of a boutique, a very expensive-looking boutique, he pulled her close to him. His cologne was light, almost spicy. She liked it. He gave her a pointed look. I want you to go in there and buy yourself a dress. He lifted his eyebrows in a gesture that told her she'd better not argue with him. In fact, I want you to buy yourself a couple of outfits. The staff will charge anything you want to my rooms. Our rooms. Got it? If we need to go shopping somewhere else tomorrow, then we can. She didn't respond. Would you like me to come in with you or wait out here? She crossed her arms, not budging. He sighed. Look, you look beautiful. But I get it. You want to fit the atmosphere. Buy a fancy dress. I consider it a work expense. You said I'm not working for you. True, but I am still paying your firm. This was ridiculous. So you should buy me a dress? All humor faded from his face. Go buy a stinking dress. I'm starving. He turned on his boot heel, moved back toward the restaurant, flung back and said, Consider it payment for all the times you helped me clean the high school. She watched him leave all nervous butterflies and sweaty palms. How could he do that to her? Ugh. In high school, Montana had always paid on dates, even when he didn't have much money. During their senior year, he'd taken a job as a night janitor at the high school just so he'd have money to take her out. Those had been some fun times, because she'd always met him at the high school and helped him. Jason had helped, too. They'd blast their music and do the work in record time. By the end, he and Jason usually just split the paycheck. She blinked and sniffed. He'd always treated her like a queen, at least as much as he could. Her stomach growled and she was propelled into the shop. She squared her shoulders. Fine, she would get a dress. Chapter 19 Montana sat by the tall window that overlooked the ocean. He could hear it rolling in and closed his eyes for a second, relishing being here. He grinned as he thought of the look on Lily's face when he'd ordered her to go spend his money. Dang, she was stubborn. He liked it. When they were young, neither one had a lot of money, but it had never been a thing. By the end, when they had plans to elope, they wanted to come back and work and then do their list. Then they would go to college. Then they weren't sure. They'd talked about a singing career, but Montana hadn't known if he was good enough. He'd wanted it, but more than anything, he'd wanted her. Those feelings rushed through him even more powerfully now, which was strange. It had been eight years, eight years of life, Real life. Still, it felt like they knew each other to their core. That's what first love did to people. He'd written his fair share of songs about it. A string of words played together in his mind. Eight years and love still shines, always circling through time. He tried a different melody. He liked it. He picked up one of the shrimp appetizers and dipped it in the sauce. He'd been sipping lemon water and had eaten a couple, taking care to leave her some. Leaving then had felt so right, but she wouldn't stay with him now without a fight. 
This was what he spent most of his life doing. He dug his phone out of his pocket and went to the app he used to capture lines of music for later. He punched in the lines, humming a different tune, wishing for his guitar. When he caught the flash of yellow from the corner of his eye, he turned, and he was sure his heart had stopped. Lil. She'd taken her long blonde hair and wrapped it up in some kind of updo, leaving trailing wisps of hair. The dress was a halter top and hugged her body in all the right places. Her sandals had laces crisscrossing up her legs. His attraction went from being at a 10 to an off-the-scale 20. Her lips, covered with his favorite fire-red lipstick, widened as she got closer. Then she scrunched up her face at him. His heart nearly stopped. It was the same crazy look she used to give him across class when she thought the teacher wasn't looking. A look that said, this is between me and you. Personal. Telling. At the beginning of this journey, he'd thought he could be with her and walk away and be okay. But now there was already going to be serious collateral damage to his heart if she wasn't in his life. He stood as she got to the table and plunked into the chair across from him. Oh my goodness, is that shrimp? Reaching over, she took one and shoved the whole thing into her mouth. The magic moment was broken, and they were teenagers again. Falling into his chair, he broke into laughter. What? she asked with a full mouth, reaching for another shrimp. He took a shrimp and grinned, shoving it in, copying her, and then going for another. Nothing, he said through a full mouth. She busted into giggles and reached for another. They were both reaching for more and stuffing them into their mouths and laughing. Silly, happy, free. That's how he felt at this moment, so completely himself. Not Montana Crew, the billionaire. Montana Crew, the boy in love. Finally, they got a hold of themselves as the waiter came to the table, giving them a slight scowl. Montana recovered and ordered a steak, rice, and salad. The server turned to Lily, and she frantically searched the menu. Hmm, hmm, I guess I'll have what he's having. Steak, medium rare, rice, and salad. She closed her menu and pushed it to the server. Montana couldn't help smiling at Lily Ray. She looked completely unsure of herself. What? She flung at him, but returned his smile. Nothing. They both searched the other's eyes. Montana cleared his throat and turned to the ocean. It's beautiful here. She followed his gaze. It's breathtaking. That too? He stared at her. She looked back and immediately blushed. He leaned forward. You are breathtaking, Lily Ray. More blushing, and she turned back to the ocean. Don't. Please don't. He thought of her boyfriend and rolled his eyes. For a few minutes, neither of them said anything. Is your life always this way? He paused. What do you mean? Getting everything you want? Unsure of how to answer, he thought for a moment. Some of it is. I have the freedom to go anywhere and do most things. I have people that arrange things. I can eat whatever and wear whatever. Heck. He looked at her and she grinned. Oh, sorry. I think I just threw up a little bit in my mouth. It was their joke. The joke she and Jason and Montana used to do when the other was too full of himself. He grinned and put his hands up in surrender, thinking how different she was from any of the dates he'd had of late. Different from anyone. She was Lil. She was the woman who knew what he was thinking, laughed at the same stupid jokes. She was, if someone were to ask him, what he'd been looking for since he'd lost her. Someone that got him. Yes, it might sound cliche, but it didn't feel cliche. Montana, she interrupted his thoughts. Oh, he'd truly been in his own mind. Sorry, he shook his head. Right, yeah, so it's kind of crazy. He held up a finger. But everything's not perfect. The press, very annoying sometimes. 
like when they reported your ex-wife left you? Her admission actually warmed him. You have paid attention to my life. Exhaling, she picked up her water and took a sip. No, I don't pay attention, but there was one day. I was standing in the grocery store line. It was, I'm just going to say it was a bad day. I'd had daddy's funeral, and then I'd taken mama back to the care center. When I got to Billings, I had to stop at the store and get a couple of things. I'm not gonna lie. She paused. I was feeling pretty low. I remember getting a glimpse of your face on the magazine, and I did something I never do. I picked it up and read the article. He scoffed. Maybe it made your bad day happier. Narrowing her eyes, she frowned. No, it actually made it worse, because I was sad for you. The center of his heart was pierced. This took him off balance because he knew she was telling the truth. He'd envisioned her just hating him. That's what it had felt like until now. She held his eyes. I know I said I didn't keep track of you, but I never quit. I guess I was worrying about you and wondering. I didn't let myself get caught up in your life. That wouldn't have been good for me. But that day, I realized that you had stuff too. Blinking, he looked out at the ocean. It wasn't just that she was Lil. It was that she got him. She understood him in a way he'd never felt anyone else ever had. He looked back at her. We lost a baby, he said bluntly, not knowing why he was telling her. For a second, she held her water in midair. She put it down. Her face went pale and she licked her lips. I'm sorry, Montana. He pulled in a long breath appreciating her compassion more than she would ever know. Karen tried to get pregnant for a long time, more than a year. They tried some fertility treatments, both got tested, but it wasn't happening. He hesitated. Then it did, and it was like there was sunshine again. He cleared his throat and unsuccessfully fought the emotion in his throat. Her name was Beatrice Hart Crew. She was born with heart problems. They did surgery, but she died two days later. He hadn't realized that tears were falling down his cheeks. He'd never talked about this with anyone. Leaning in, she reached out and took his hand, tears in her own eyes. I'm so sorry. He thought of that pain. Then it subsided, receding like a wave in the ocean. He squeezed her hand. We both grieved. I had just started the show deal in Vegas and had to be there three days a week. She hated Nashville, but she didn't want to be with me in Vegas. Or she just didn't want me anymore. He sniffed, hating the vulnerability in his voice. He took a drink of water. Lil waited, sympathy and reassurance in her eyes. So she went back to L.A. She hooked up with an old boyfriend I found out from my agent when a newspaper called before they were running the story. You didn't give her half, did you? Taking her hand back, she sat up straighter. For affairs, you never give half. She wagged her finger. He shrugged. The attorney side of her had come out, and it was cute. I gave her some assets, a large chunk of money and a stipend every month. My attorney advised me not to, but in the end, I just had to forgive her. It was eating me alive, Lil. Losing the baby. Losing her. I just had to let go. He paused. He hated himself for saying it, but he couldn't stop himself. Maybe I'm just not worth keeping around. Meeting his gaze, she shook her head back and forth. Don't do that. He looked at his water glass. It's true. She took his hand again. You had idiot parents, okay? Staring back at her, he couldn't stop himself. You left. Yanking back her hand, she let out a laugh. This is rich. Who needs dessert with the rich stuff you're serving up? He put up a hand. Wait, I know. I know. I left. He took her hand. Yeah, you left, she countered. And you don't know what I went through. You will never have any idea what you gave up. 
She yanked her hand back. He could see her start to tremble. He took her hand back. Shh. He felt like he was calming a skittish horse. You're right, Lil. You're right, it's on me. Lily picked up her napkin and wiped beneath the edges of her eyes. She sucked in a breath and shook her head. Liking that she was the same kind, compassionate woman, he leaned back and watched her try to get composure for herself. You were always big-hearted, Lil. She scoffed. No, not really. Yes. He grinned and let the heartache go for a minute. Remember that campaign you did when you ran for student body president? She'd been taking a sip of water and she spit it out. A piece of ice skidded across the table and landed on his lap. He laughed. You remember? She pointed at him. But I didn't win. He laughed harder. Montana Henry Crew, you were just as culpable as me. Oh, no. He shook his head. That was all you and Jason. The football team hid my towel every day for a month because of that stunt. Do you think we liked having the grass all holy? Hey, she said, laughing through tears. Those moles needed a voice. You were invading their habitat. She laughed even harder, holding her stomach and doubling over. They needed you to fence off half the field and put up tiny save the moles signs? Her laughter was contagious, and he laughed harder too. At the way they had fought over it, she sighed. Oh my gosh, I have not thought about that for so long. You always had passion, I'll give you that. She grinned. I'm just remembering all the fights you got into on my behalf that year. What was it, like four or five? He laughed again. Right, try like eight. She didn't laugh. You were so bent on defending me against all those lugheads. Feeling the old protectiveness, he grinned. They were lugheads. They couldn't say stuff about you. You were my girlfriend. They better watch their mouths. Montana felt palpable energy crackle the air. Sniffing, she shook her head. We were really in love, weren't we? Pulling in a breath, he nodded. Yeah, Lil, we were. For a second, there was everything between them. And nothing between them. He wondered if having almost everything had ruined it all. What? She asked. Nothing. No, you made me tell you, now you have to spill, Lily insisted. The food came, and he was grateful for a respite. Things were intense. They'd always been intense with her. Chapter 20 Lily took a bite of her steak, but didn't really taste it. All she could taste was this tension between them. The way Montana looked at her. The way they spoke to each other. The things they remembered, like heat, passion, and joy. It was all rolled up in this beautiful that you licked on the hottest day, but you knew you had to pace yourself or you would get brain freeze. Tell me something, Lil. She shook her head. No. They ate for a bit in silence. It had to be the best steak of her life. The ocean was almost close enough to touch. The sun had set and it was getting darker. It looked simultaneously beautiful and mysterious and haunting. She couldn't believe that she was here. It was amazing. Had Jason known it would be this way? What are you thinking? Montana asked. Nothing. She felt caught. Liar. Staring at his eyes, she let out a light laugh. It almost felt exactly the same as it had been. It was disconcerting. Fine, Jason always wanted this so badly. Surfing? She let out a breath. No, this. Us. Back together. Oh. She was probably telling him too much, but it didn't seem to matter. It was coming out. He made it his mission to pick at me when I'd stop in to see him on Sundays after seeing Mama. We'd play checkers, and he'd always tell me I needed to go see you. A sad look passed across Montana's face. I wish you both would have come to see me. Feeling awkward, she pushed on. Of course, I always told him to shut up, but he never listened to me. 
It put her on edge that things had slipped into this easiness between them so quickly. Her mind flashed to Jason holding her hand on that day, and she blinked. But you know Jason. I wish things would have been different. He put down his fork and tapped his mouth with his napkin. I regret so many things. For a brief moment, she wondered if Montana knew her secret. Would he forgive her as easily as he'd forgiven his ex-wife? Tell me about Brad, Montana said in a low whisper. Jerked out of her thoughts, she wiped her face with the napkin. Ah, uh, no. Cutting his steak, he nodded at her. I don't have the advantage of magazine articles, so tell me the boring story. Meeting his eyes, she saw he was truly interested. Well, let's see. I met Brad my first year in law school. I worked part-time at the firm. We both have a passion for family law. Right, what else? What do you mean? Come on, Lil. If he were a song, what would the lyrics be? He made you feel like a flower in the spring, or like the whole world had righted itself. Memories of him and lyrics rushed through her. You're always writing a song. He flashed her a smile. Can't help it. She thought of Brad. Nothing came to mind. Wow, I'm truly touched. Shut up, we're not all writers. He laughed. She cleared her throat. Okay, he's the lead on the case I'm going back for the day after tomorrow. Right. Montana waved his fork in a circle. Ah, this is why you're dating him. What? Because he's passionate about protecting kids? It took her off guard that he'd understood that. In fact, she hadn't thought about that being the main reason. Makes sense. He took another bite. Lily hesitated. Why does it make sense? Tilting his head to the side, he let out a sigh and wiped his face. Lil, things with your dad. She felt red moving up her neck. It was a stark reminder, even though Montana didn't know one secret, he knew other secrets. She cleared her throat and shook her head. Anyway, Montana encouraged. Yes, Brad works hard for the children, the women, and the men. He works for the best interest of our clients. Anyway, by the time I graduated, he'd dropped several hints about dating. Montana pointed his steak knife at her. But you didn't want to. She grinned. I never said that. You said he dropped hints. She sighed liking and hating that he was listening so closely. I didn't want to date one of the partners. She shrugged. But he sold out pretty quickly when the price was right. She gave him a pointed look. Immediately getting it, he nodded. He was one of the partners who decided you'd work with me. To his credit, your money does mean more money for pro bono cases. He stared at her, not saying anything. She rushed on. I mean, I can understand we'll be able to help a lot more people. He still didn't say anything. What? His voice came out quiet. You didn't have to do it. Why did you do it? I was honestly worried you'd quit. She didn't want to admit it. They offered me partner. Oh. His eyebrows went up. And my name on the door. He nodded. Nice. I'm proud of you. It bothered her that he said it and that it meant something to her. Shut up. He laughed. Ah, Lil, you won't be happy until you earn it. For real. She hadn't realized it, but he was right. She didn't want to be promoted without merit. He shrugged. So, back to Brad. She frowned. I don't know why I like him. Maybe because he tries hard in the courtroom. With me, he... We haven't, she cleared her throat. Been together. Oh. This time, Montana blushed. She knew she was blushing. He's been patient. Making him earn it. Good for you. Shaking his head, he clicked his tongue. Too bad poor old Brad is out of the running. What are you talking about? He shook his head. The way you're talking about him makes me think you're not that into him. He widened his eyes. What do you mean, she scoffed. You can just tell? 
he shrugged. I can just tell. She narrowed her eyes again, giving him her patented glare. Don't look at me that way, he chewed happily. How come you think you know? Because, he said, I can tell. How? He laughed. I just can. How? She demanded. He glared at her. Fine. Because that's the same way you always talked about Jason. This ignited a flame inside of her. She became very still. She leaned over, her two years of courtroom experience coming in handy at the moment. Except the day you caught us kissing, right? The day you left me. His happy look went blank and then cold. You were in a lip lock with him. He was in a lip lock with me. No, you were kissing him back, he accused quietly. Her thoughts scrambled. She tried to remember anything about that kiss, other than the moment Montana had caught them. For eight years, that had been the moment she'd focused on. But now, looking back, seeing with the experience of a woman dating Brad, after much persuasion, she could see what Montana had seen that day. Jason was angry when I told him we were leaving. When he pulled me in for a hug, I felt how much he liked me. And then when he kissed me... Gasping, she dropped her fork and put her hand to her mouth. I did kiss him back. Montana only nodded his head. See, the kiss was convincing. She couldn't believe it. Oh my gosh. That's right, Lil. You had feelings for him, too. You did. Just like Brad. You're reluctant about it, but you do like him. She couldn't deny it. Maybe I did have feelings for him, Montana. Her voice broke. But you broke my heart that day. She pushed back from the table and stood. You broke my heart, and I still haven't forgiven you. Then she was rushing from the table, rushing through the lobby, she bypassed the elevator and slipped off her shoes, holding them in her hand as she climbed the stairs to the sixth floor. She ran to her room, tears streaming down her face. Inside the room, she pushed the door shut and leaned back against it. How had that just happened? She felt like a complete idiot. It was eight years later. She'd just made a complete idiot of herself. There was a light knock behind her. She closed her eyes but raised her voice. Please just leave me alone, Montana. How many times did she have to tell him? Lil, come on. Let's talk about this. Chapter 21 Montana stood outside the door and banged again. He would be lying if he said he hadn't thought about having this conversation a million times. He would also be lying if he said it didn't feel dang good to rile her up. She'd been getting him riled up in all kinds of ways for a decade. He hadn't been able to get those kisses out of his mind from the other night at the water tower. The feel of her, the same but different. She was a woman now. She was beautiful. What he hadn't anticipated was that she hadn't actually realized her feelings for Jason. She swung the door open. Black streaks trailing down her face. Exasperated, she pointed to her new yellow sundress. Look at this mess. Unable to stop himself, he pulled her into his arms, chuckling and stroking her hair. Why are you laughing at me? She demanded. But she didn't pull away, which was a good sign. I'm not laughing at you, Lily Ray. I'm thinking how adorable you look with your sad face and your black eyes and your messed up dress. She sniffed. Pulling her back, he gestured to the love seat. Come on, Lil, let's talk. She pushed him back. No, I can't, Montana. I just, I have to get work done. Montana held his ground at the door. No, I've waited eight years to have this talk. Resigned, she moved to the side. Fine, I've waited to talk too. They sat on the couch and he pulled her next to him. He still had his hand in hers. Tell me. She frowned at him. You had to bring up the elephant in the room, didn't you? 
The sides of his eyes creased and he sighed. Bill, do you think I was stupid enough not to know that Jason had feelings for you? Do you? I just... I was selfish. Of course I saw that he had feelings for you. I mean, he was always on board to hang out with you. To include you. I saw the way he looked at you. He talked about you like you were his girlfriend. I mean, he knew that you and I were together. But there was part of my silly teenage self that felt like... It felt like this. He had a family, and I had you. He had everything, had always had everything. I had you. That made everything fair. She sighed and sat further back into the couch. It wasn't a competition, Montana. Even though he didn't want to be this way, it needed to be said. But it was, Lil. He sighed. I would have given Jason anything, anything except you. When I came down the stairs and saw you kissing him, something snapped inside of me. Call it right or wrong. All my fears of being abandoned and unlovable just came to the surface. All the times Jason had joked that he would steal you away, that somehow you'd pick him, had been realized, and... He felt a lump form in his throat. After the night before when... He broke off. The night you made love to me. Her chin cocked up defiantly. He melted inside. That night was so important to me. She put her hand over his. You were right. We should have waited. But I wanted to. It was a mistake. Thoughts of that night swamped him. Of her coming to his window so upset over a fight with her father the swollen fingers of a handprint across her face. All he'd wanted was to protect her. No, he shook his head. It was the best night of my life. He paused. It just left me wanting you, all of you. Then when I saw you kissing Jason, I doubted everything. Doubted what? This, I mean that, us, everything. Another round of tears welled in her eyes, and she pulled away. It was my fault. He put a hand on her knee. Lil, I never regretted it. Yes, you did. No, I regretted leaving. They sat there, saying nothing. Not having to. Standing, she threw her hands into the air and sniffed. Well, now you've done it, Montana. What? My face is a disaster. My dress is ruined, and I'm still hungry. Montana wanted to talk about so much more, but all he could do was smile back at her. I can fix that. Fifteen minutes later, they were both changed into T-shirts and shorts. They'd bought a bag of junk food and some water from the little store in the hotel and taken their towels out toward the beach. The wind was on his face, and the faint scent of lemon circled into him. Lil was by his side, and Montana felt better than he'd felt since he was 18. His heart was light. She turned and laughed, her teeth flashing in the moonlight, matching the glint of her hair. She was breathtaking. He'd been married to a supermodel, but if he was truthful with himself, Lil was the prettiest girl he'd ever known. They settled onto the beach and ceremoniously clinked water bottles. Bill held hers up in the air and looked out at the ocean. I wish Jason was here. Me too. The center of Montana's chest filled with warmth. They both gulped back the water and shared a bag of Doritos, a bag of cheddar popcorn, and a tub of chocolate ice cream. Bill laughed. I'm going to be sick tomorrow. Montana agreed, lying back on the towel. We have one more day. I want to show you around. I have to work, she protested. Montana turned to her. Do what you gotta do. Then I'll show you around. She lay back too. I won't refuse a guided tour of Oahu. They listened to the ocean and stared at the stars. What are you thinking? Montana asked. I'm thinking this is perfect. Being here, remembering our friend, together. It is. 
He reached for her hand. She tugged it back. Let's not. Because of Brad? She hesitated. It's been a long day. Let's just enjoy it, okay? Fine. But it was an outright lie. Good. Good, he agreed. She laughed and turned to him, staring into his eyes. Montana? What? When we're together, are you always going to look at me the way you did when we were young? He knew she didn't want to hear it, so he just gave her a dopey face and stuck out his tongue. Is that better? She laughed and swatted at him. Much. He laughed too. He reached for her hand, finding it in the sand. He put his hand on top of hers. Friends, he challenged. Her eyes flashed down to their hands for a moment. Then she turned to the sky. Fine. Friends. Lil? Yeah? You're going to finish the list with me, right? She sighed. Yeah. She stood. Only if you help me collect shells for Jason's mom. Montana grinned and stood. You got it. He searched for shells and felt extremely grateful. He'd been living his life. Everything was fine. But until Lil had shown up at his concert, it was like he'd been hearing only part of the music. Now, with Lil back, all the parts of the accompaniment were working together. Chapter 22 When Lily finally got back to her room, she was exhausted. Falling onto the bed, she heard her phone buzz. Picking it up, she saw it was just after midnight. There were eight texts from Brad and five missed calls. Resolved to face the music, she pressed Brad's number. Lily, he answered on the first ring. Hey. Hey. His voice was hard. Are you having a good time? Sitting up, she ran a hand over her face. She wasn't in the mood for games. I don't know. Should I be? Is that in Montana's contract with the firm to retain my services? I have to have a good time? She wanted to remind him he was the reason she was in Hawaii. Sorry, he acquiesced. How are you? Fine. She didn't speak for a few seconds. She was not fine. There were emotions roiling inside of her she hadn't felt for a long time. Lily? She cleared her throat. Is everything ready for Jared's case? Yes, it's on the docket for Thursday at one. You'll be back for it? The maid, is she testifying? Brad sighed. I went to see her today, put some pressure on her. I couldn't get a straight answer. This was the part of the law Lily didn't like. The part she couldn't control. The part where she couldn't guarantee justice. Okay. An awkward pause passed between them. Lily, talk to me, he urged. Knowing it wasn't actually Brad's fault she was here, Montana had given her the choice. She offered the truth. We surfed for Jason today. What? The summer before our senior year, we made a list we wanted to do. Surfing in Hawaii was on the list. He was quiet. Brad? I wish I was there with you. She could picture him, sitting at his home office desk with his computer open and a stack of files next to him. Montana had been right. Part of the reason she liked Brad was because he fought the good fight for these people. He truly cared about the right thing happening for the women and children in abusive relationships. But she couldn't say she wished he were here. It's beautiful. He sighed. I miss you. It was easy to grant him the next words. I miss you too. She did. Even though she hadn't really thought of him, hadn't had a chance to think of him. Abruptly, guilt assailed her, and she had to tell him. We kissed. What? His voice was angry. Last night, we had a moment remembering the past. That's all it was. There was nothing more. There couldn't be. She could hear him sucking in large, deep breaths. Lily, if there's something you need to tell me, just tell me. There's nothing else to tell you. Her voice was firm. 
so I'll see you in court on Thursday? Yeah. His voice was sad. Can I take you to dinner after? Brad was a fighter. Okay, she agreed. When will you go back to him? She realized they hadn't even talked about the final plans to finish the list. I'm not sure. Okay. Night, Brad. Night. The next morning, Lily woke early and kept her eyes closed, listening to the ocean. She thought of Montana's warm hand on hers last night. It was ridiculous, being in Hawaii with Montana, but it felt so natural, so real, like her life had been on pause and someone had finally hit the play button. She heard his knock on the door. Flinging back the covers, she grabbed the hotel robe and slipped it on. She left the safety latch in place and cracked the door. Montana laughed, and she laughed too. What are you doing? She asked. I'm getting your sorry butt out of bed to go sightseeing. No working. I'm paying your firm for you to be here. She had actually stayed up late finishing her work. She scrunched up her face. Great, let's go. Pausing, he didn't seem to trust her. Really? For someone that bosses people around and always gets what he wants, you sure look surprised to get your way. He mimicked her silly scrunched up face. It's about time you gave me what I want. She felt the underlying tension. He winked at her. Bring your swimsuit. We might snorkel more too. He turned and pointed at her. And I'm buying you stuff, so don't complain about it. Thirty minutes later, they were flying down the highway by the ocean in a red convertible Mustang. The humid, salty air blew on her face. She felt free and alive, and unlike the person she'd been the past couple of years. Montana turned and grinned at her. What? You're beautiful, he yelled over the wind. Butterflies erupted inside of her. Stop saying that. It's true, he took her hand. I'm only holding your hand as friends. He wiggled his eyebrows mischievously. For a brief moment, she thought of Brad. Then she pushed the thought away. There would be no denying Montana his hand holding, and she knew it. They went to a place called Sandy's Beach. The waves were too high when they both got out, so they came right back to the car and moved on. They went to Hanauma Bay next and snorkeled away the rest of the morning. He insisted he take her to downtown Waikiki to the best snow cone place she'd ever been. They went to a big outdoor market where he bought her anything she even glanced at. By the end, it was a game. They walked out with three bags of stuff, including three Hawaiian dresses. After getting showered and changed at the hotel, they attended a Hawaiian luau on the beach by their hotel. It culminated in a fire dancing show and Montana insisting she go out and dance with the others. Of course, they pulled Montana out, too, and they both danced away the rest of the night with the whole group. When he took her up to the room, she moved to put the key in the slot, but he made a vice-like cage around her and turned her around to him. She giggled. Stop. He stayed there, his scent mixing up her senses and the feel of his breath on her face completely taking her off guard. Montana, I really want to kiss you. I've wanted to all day. I have a boyfriend, she countered. He made a silly face. She giggled and felt young and silly herself. Gently, he reached up and brushed a piece of hair out of her face. It was a good day, Lil. Suddenly, her heart felt stuck in her throat. No, no, no. She could feel herself melting right there in the hallway. It was a good day. He traced her cheek down to her jaw. Fire burned the trail where he touched. I can't, Montana. When are we going to finish the list? They were close. His lips were only centimeters away. All thoughts were muddled except the ones dealing with her lips touching his. Uh, I don't know. You only have to be in Billings one day, right? Right. Meet me in Vegas Friday night. Come to the show and meet the guys in the band. He cleared his throat. I'll book you a room next to mine. Sunday morning, we'll do the hot air balloon ride. He hadn't moved, and blood whooshed through her head. K. 
Kiss him, kiss him, kiss him, her inner voice screamed at her. Their chemistry was irresistible, and she realized she didn't think it would be possible to stop whatever was happening if he pressed again. Okay, her voice faltered. Lil, he asked softly. Yeah? Can I kiss you? No, she answered quickly but didn't move. Because of Brad? She giggled. You sound jealous, Montana. He kept his eyes trained on her lips. I've always been jealous. The last eight years I thought I was over you. And honestly, when I was married, I loved her. I did. But dreams of you have wrecked me. At every show, I see you. In the crowd, swaying to my love ballads. We have a second chance, Lil. She looked up at his eyes, and tears were budding. I wanted to give you more than anything money could buy. I wanted to give you me, all of me, and I wanted you. I still do. She was gone, just like the other night at the water tower. Their lips met and moved in perfect harmony. His hand moved down her hair and then down her back, pulling her closer. She melted into him. Unable to stop herself, she ran her hands up his chest and face, loving his five o'clock shadow, loving the way he tasted like the drink they'd had at the luau. Lil, he sighed between kisses. Lil. Every part of her wanted him closer. I can't, Montana. She pulled back. He leaned in and pulled her closer, kissing her longer, drinking from her like a man finding water in a desert. A light laugh escaped her. It was true. This thing with Montana was bigger than any feelings she'd ever had for any other man. But thoughts of what she'd done flashed into her mind. She pulled back. Montana. He bent, nibbling more at her neck. Come on, Lil. We're perfect for each other. We'll do it right this time. We'll wait until we're married. He pulled back, squarely looking her in the eye. Jason gave us a second chance. Let's take it. The idea circled inside of her, thrilled her. But Montana didn't know. He could never know. He brushed a hand down her hair, starting little fires with his touch. What do you say, Lil? Unwanted tears surfaced, and she felt the truth rising inside of her, bubbling and wanting to come out. But she couldn't tell him. Silently, she cursed Jason. Why had he done this to her? Lil. Montana leaned in and gently kissed the side of her lips. Almost everything. What are you talking about? Abruptly, Lily pushed back, keeping her hands on Montana's chest in order to ensure the distance between them. I'll finish the list with you, but I can't do this. Turning for the door, she pushed her key card inside and then pushed into her room. I'll talk to you in the morning. Chapter 23 Montana woke the next morning to his phone alarm. Flipping back the covers, he hopped out of bed. It was something that he'd gotten into the habit of doing, hopping out of bed. It never did any good to sit around and moan in the morning. It had been something he'd done even as a foster kid growing up. Getting his running shoes, he slipped them on and grabbed his phone and headphones. In five minutes, he was out the hotel doors and on the beach, starting into a sprint. This was also part of his life. He liked to do things that kept him healthy. Right now, all he could do was think about how to get Lily Ray Gold back again. She was his match. They fit together like a puzzle. She knew it, too. He could feel she knew it. Why was she denying both of them? It was as real as anything he'd ever experienced. They were amazing together. He just had to figure out a way to convince her. Finally, he'd found purpose in his life again. A real purpose. Music gave his life purpose, but Lil gave his life everything. Lily could have her law practice. They'd set her up in Jackson. Or heck, he'd move to Billings so she could be close to her mother. Another thought went through his mind. They could even build a house in Springs Hollow. 
at least have a home there for part of the time. They could go to the high school games. He could see Cindy and Frank. He could donate to the football team. He grinned, loving this feeling of purpose. Then he stopped short, seeing her, the outline of her, in her black spandex, holding a yoga position on the rock next to the beach. She looked like a picture, like a song. The music rushed into him. He stopped, plunking down on the beach all out of breath. He pulled up the notes app on his phone and began putting down lines of music. The chorus sounded through him. Been waiting for you all my life, but the winds of fortune didn't go our way. Now they're in sync with the wings of our life. We just have to fly. We just have to fly. Goosebumps rushed over him. Lily turned and looked at him. Another round of chills. She broke her pose and laughed. He stood laughing too. Then he realized that's what he loved about her. Their laughter. Just seeing each other. The way she was. It was like they were 16 again. Like nothing had changed. He rushed to her. She looked confused and started toward him. What? She giggled. Before she could argue, he picked her up and swung her around. She giggled. You're crazy. He didn't let her go. I don't know what's keeping us apart, but you're back in my heart, Lily Ray Gold, and I'll do whatever it takes to keep you. I know you have a boyfriend, he laughed. Tell him I'm sorry about this. Gently, he put her down and then went down on one knee. Lily Ray, please put me out of my misery and marry me. The smile on her face went blank, and then her skin paled. Marry you. He rushed on. It might seem out of the blue, but you know it's not. You know it's the only thing we can do to fix the past. I'll make you happy, Lil. I promise. A mixture of emotions flicked over her face, ones he hadn't seen before. She pulled her hand free of his, then shook her head. She started back to the hotel. We have to get to the airport. I can't be late for court. Montana wasn't deterred. Catching up to her, he moved in front of her, put both hands on her shoulders and searched her eyes. I know it's this stupid secret. I don't know how I know, but I know you. I wish I could make you believe this. I don't care about it. You never have to tell me as long as you will let it get out of our way. Tears formed in her eyes, and she pulled away, running to the hotel. It will never work. Chapter 24 Walking out of the courtroom, Lily pushed all thoughts of what had happened earlier with Montana out of her mind. She'd been trying to push Montana out of her mind all day, on the plane ride to Billings and during the trial. Brad took her hand and let out a whoop, lifting his laptop case into the air. We did it! She nodded, a satisfied grin spreading across her face. We did it. Jared Carter's mother had been awarded full custody, and the courts had allowed only chaperoned visits with his father until Jared was 18. To top it off, the mother had to approve of the visits, so if the father didn't behave, he didn't get access to Jared. It was the best-case scenario. She felt good about that. Brad tugged her toward his car. I've made reservations at your favorite Italian restaurant downtown. How does that sound? Perfect. They got to his car, and Brad held the door for her, gently kissing her on the cheek. I'm glad you're here. Lily slipped into the car and wondered if she should tell Brad what had happened. Honestly, she wasn't sure about her own reaction to Montana, and she didn't know how she would explain it. Brad pulled out of the parking spot, glancing her way. So you've had a good couple of days? It was obvious he was curious, but he wasn't outright cross-examining her. Yet. She wondered when the lawyer would come out. She stared out the window. Yeah. He cleared his throat. I thought about what you said the other night. I pushed you into doing what you're doing, so it's not fair to get mad at you. Lily couldn't focus on what he was saying. All she could think about was Montana softly kissing her forehead at the airport and telling her he'd see her in Vegas. He'd been wearing Hawaiian clothes, 
a flowered shirt, khaki shorts, flip-flops. His hair had been gelled, so he looked like a complete tourist. Longing went through her, winding its way into her heart. It was strange that eight years later they'd be meeting in Vegas together. Together? Well, not really together, but she would be there with him. But not really with him. Lily. Brad pulled into the restaurant parking garage and rolled down his window to get the parking ticket. Have you heard anything I've said? Turning to face him, she knew she had to be honest with him. Brad, I'm sorry. I think you should just take me home. At her town home, Brad didn't handle the breakup well. Standing on her front porch, he pinched his lips. You know we're perfect together. He clenched one fist. I'll quit the firm too. Brad, putting up his hand, he shook his head. This is all my fault. I did push you into this. I should never have agreed with the partners on this. I should have fought harder against them. It was sweet and sad to see Brad worked up. There had never really been anything for him to fight for. Her heart had always belonged to Montana. She may not have realized it, but it didn't mean it wasn't true. It's over, Brad. I'm sorry. He stared at her for a couple of moments. Then he turned and took the steps off her porch, whirling back at the bottom. The only thing I'll tell you, Lily, is he's going to break your heart. His lips trembled. You've never been good at giving too much of yourself. I don't know if that's because of him, but I just hope he doesn't break you completely this time. Now, as Lily tossed and turned in bed, all she could think about was Montana. Her phone buzzed and she reached for it. It was from Montana. Can I send a plane for you early? Hot air balloon opening tomorrow morning. Her heart pounded. It was strange. They were texting. Hesitating, she texted him back. Okay. Be at airport at six. Okay. She leaned back on the pillow and let her mind go back to that fateful night. They'd been with their group, celebrating their high school graduation. She'd been sitting by Montana, her head on his shoulder. The bonfire was in front of them. Jason had been nursing a drink on her other side. A bunch of their peers from school and a couple of the girls begged Montana to play. He picked up his guitar, and he played a song she'd never heard before. His eyes had been intense and only focused on her. You gave me light. You brought life. I promise I won't ever leave you. I was lost before you, and now I'm found. Take me. Give me the rest of your life and I'll give you mine. Every part of her felt the sincerity of his words. He put the guitar down and his whole face lit up. Others got up and walked to the cooler to get a drink, and even when they slapped his back and told him good job, he never broke their gaze. Jason put an arm around her and his other hand on Montana's shoulder. She turned to him and smiled. She was so happy. They'd just graduated, they had their list, and they were going to change the world. Jason let them go and wandered off to talk to someone else. Montana leaned over, kissing her on the ear. Warm chills rushed through her. We're going to have it all, Lil. Everything. Then she leaned over and kissed his lips, knowing her life would be amazing with him by her side. When she'd gone home and found her father drunk, Everything had changed. It didn't take much for her father to beat her. Usually after one good slap, he'd leave her alone. But he seemed especially angry that night. He chased her, telling her it was her fault for breaking curfew. Her mother screamed. She'd run, but he'd grabbed her hair. Fire screamed from her skull. Out the front door to the front yard, taking off his belt. Then the pain started. He got her side and back. Then he left. Suddenly she heard more of her mother's screams. Forcing herself to stand, she ran, through the field to Jason's house. Quietly, she'd gone up the deck steps and directly to Montana's room. She tapped gently on the glass. Then he was there, tugging open the window, frowning as he inspected her face, 
and insisting she lift her shirt and show him. Without saying a word, he'd taken her hand and told her he would beat the crap out of her father. She'd been so afraid. She'd begged Montana not to do anything. The look of anger on his face terrified her. Take me to the fort. Reluctantly, he nodded. When she climbed behind him on the motorcycle, it was the first time all night she'd felt safe. When they arrived, he'd held her, stroked her hair, and told her no one would hurt her the rest of her life. She'd believed him. Take me away forever, Montana. Tomorrow. Going still, he'd nodded. We'll go to Vegas tomorrow morning and start the rest of our lives together. Getting up, she picked up her phone and pulled up the only picture she kept on it. Staring back at her was the picture of a six-year-old little girl wearing a backpack on her first day of school. Pain seared into her chest, and the crack that had reopened when she'd first seen Montana at his concert now erupted. Magma exploded out in epic proportions. Her daughter. She touched the screen. Their daughter. Her intense green eyes, her long dark hair and sweet crooked smile. A tear fell down her cheek. Montana would change his mind when he knew about her. She knew it. She had ripped away his flesh and blood. He'd never forgive her for it. But he deserved to know. Chapter 25 Montana waited at the airport, grinning to himself. Lily was coming to Vegas to be with him. Well, strike that. Not to be with him. She had a boyfriend. She'd made that perfectly clear. But she was coming to Vegas, and they were about to do the second thing on Jason's list. It was enough. For now. When he saw her get off his jet, her blonde hair was back in a ponytail. She wore the yellow summer dress with cute black sandals and blue toenails. She didn't have a lot of makeup on, but she didn't need it. She was a natural beauty. He got out of the car and went to her, pulling her into a hug. At first, she felt tense. Then she relaxed against him. Hey. He pulled back and stared down at her red lipstick. Immediately, he wanted to lean over and kiss it off, but he resisted. How was the flight? Pulling out of his grasp, she grinned. Awful. I mean, they ask, do you want water? Do you need a hot towel? Can we serve you a meal? What movie can we put on for you? I mean, seriously, Montana, your staff is too helpful. Fire all of them. She waved a hand into the air. He couldn't lie. When he was with her, he was off his game. He nodded and opened the limo door for her. You're right. I'll tell Kirk to pay them less. It will make them far less eager to please. She slipped in and flashed him a smile. He got in next to her, once again feeling like that 18-year-old boy wanting to beg her to marry him on the spot. It was completely off-putting to him. It made him slightly crazy that the woman he loved was sitting beside him. She was the woman he'd always loved, and he still didn't know if she would marry him or not. How was your flight yesterday? He'd flown directly to Vegas from Hawaii. He frowned. Same problem. People are just too helpful. She laughed, and he couldn't stop himself from taking her hand. She looked up at him, but didn't take it away. His cell buzzed, and he picked it up, seeing it was Kirk. He put up a finger. Sorry, it's my assistant. I have to get it. She nodded. Kirk, boss got some news for you. What do you mean? Well, remember that P.I. you hired to follow the girl? He felt the word P.I. echo through his brain. The one he'd hired before going to Billings. I can't do this right now, Kirk. That's fine, I just got a message that said he sent you some information to your email. Just letting you know. Okay. Sound check at seven, boss. I'll be there. And boss? He sighed. Yes, Kirk. She'll pick you. Don't worry. He grinned and rolled his eyes. Bye. She cocked an eyebrow. What was that about? He shook his head, smiling at her. 
Nothing that can't wait. Lily didn't know what to expect as they got to the open field outside of town, but she saw the big blue hot air balloon and her heart fluttered. She turned to Montana. It's perfect. Montana got out and held out his hand. She took it. He looked at their hands for a second before dropping hers. I know it makes you uncomfortable when I hold your hand. She gave him a once-over, her heart fluttering even more. He wasn't his Hawaiian self, but he looked more normal, not like his famous self. No cowboy hat, just boots, jeans, and a t-shirt. He looked like he'd always looked growing up, but he was a man now. He was built and firm in all the right places, and the way he was still growing out his facial hair made her want to touch his face, but she refrained. The side of his lip tugged up. Are you ready to do this? Giving a nod, she let him escort her to the balloon. They listened to the worker explain exactly how to operate the balloon. Her eyes widened and she whispered to Montana, Do you think we should just have someone go with us? Winking at her, he squeezed her hand. I got this. I've been watching YouTube videos. She laughed. Great, I feel so much safer. Ten minutes later, the workers released the ropes. Her heart skipped a beat as they lifted completely up and into the clear Las Vegas sky. It was breathtaking. She couldn't stop herself from leaning into his solid, steady body. All I can say is Jason was inspired, that's for sure. She didn't respond. Sudden dread filling her stomach. She had to tell him soon. They stayed that way as they watched the whole town of Las Vegas and the outlying areas come into view, and eventually the Strip. The spicy scent of Montana's cologne circled into her. It was sweet, spicy, and completely attractive. Bending down, he unzipped a small carry-on cooler. Surprised, she moved out of his arms. He grinned as he produced sandwiches for both of them. The aluminum foil wrapping had kept them warm. He even had little bottles of water for them. Giggles burst out before she could stop them. Wow. She was impressed he'd thought about it. The look on his face showed triumph, and he handed her the sandwich. It's my romantic side. He cleared his throat. I mean, my friendly side. Their eyes caught as they opened the wrappers and chomped a bite. Then he was behind her again, pointing and showing her the mountains and telling her their names. There's the trail I take my motorcycles out on and ride. A friend of mine owns that part of the desert. She scoffed. Of course your friend does, all your billionaire friends. He laughed. Hey, I have an idea. Okay, a week from today is... He trailed off. Jason's birthday. Right. He paused, then continued. I was thinking, what if we went to Devil's Tower and climbed it on his birthday? Do the last thing and honor him at the same time. She grinned, loving the idea. Sounds perfect. He took her hand. It is perfect. Then he looked down at their hands. Sorry. Montana, I ended it with Brad. Abruptly, he spun her toward him, taking her sandwich and his and putting them down. She giggled again, seeing the determined look in his eyes. His lips softly met hers, and she felt like a melting truffle, gooey and sweet and delicious. Pulling back, he lightly traced the side of her cheek. You've made me so happy. It's the same as it used to be, Lil, but different. Everything is perfect now. We'll make it perfect. Montana, I can't... He sighed. Lil, I told you I wouldn't ask about it, but is this secret holding you back from me? She hesitated, wanting to tell him. I don't know what it is, Lil, but whatever it is, it doesn't matter. He let out a light laugh. I mean, if you killed a man and need my help, just let me grab my shovel. Either that or I could gear up legally. This did make her laugh. You'd be willing to defend me? The moment went slow and sticky. I would do anything for you. Her heart rate went into overdrive. Montana? She chuckled.
Oh, good, it's not that. He pulled her closer, snuggling into her neck. I love you, Lil. I do. It wouldn't suit to deny how much she loved the feel of him next to her. She closed her eyes, not wanting to resist this or him. Seeming to be encouraged by her, he gently kissed the side of her neck. Admitted Lil, you can see yourself here with me. Forever. I don't care what's between us, what's in the past, or what this big secret is. All I care about is the future. Us. Here. Now. She touched the side of his cheek, and he moved into the touch, taking her hand and turning it, bending and kissing her palm. She giggled. Have you noticed that you're always trying to kiss me? Pulling her in again, he grinned, making up for lost time. They kissed, and she relished the sweetness of this man, the thrill of him, the sexy, happy way he touched and loved her. He took her breath away. Coming up for air, her heart hammered into her chest. Montana. Yes. I do have to tell you. You're a secret. He said it with a pinch of distaste around his lips. She was terrified. Yes. Don't. What? Let's just be here in this moment. He searched her eyes. It's selfish that I just want to enjoy you, but I do. So let's wait. Tonight, after the concert, you can tell me if you feel like you have to. Butterflies burst into her stomach. We'll face it, whatever it is, together. Chapter 26 Montana finished the sound check and stood by the rest of the band, waiting for pre-show fan meet and greets and whatever publicity things were lined up. He was elated. It still felt like he was up in the air, his feet not touching the ground. Lil was here. She was single. She was coming tonight. He'd bought a ring yesterday, taken himself to the jewelry store and picked it out. He knew she'd love it. Reaching into his pocket, he pulled it out and inspected it. Princess cut, two carat. Bigger than she'd want, but he figured he could buy her a couple of them. He hadn't quite decided how to ask her again. Shaking his head, he shoved the ring back into his pocket. This downtime between sound check and the show was always torture. It was even more so today, knowing he'd see Lil after the show. He pulled out his phone to distract himself for a few minutes. The email and report from the PI came up. As he read the details, his heart took off a million miles an hour. It all made sense. Denver. She'd gone there to have a baby. Give one up for adoption. Montana and Lily had a daughter together. It felt like the ground shifted beneath him, and he stumbled back, nearly falling over. You okay, boss? Kirk asked. Shoving away from Kirk, he headed to his dressing room. I can't see fans. What? Kirk asked. I'm not feeling good. He couldn't do this right now. He had a show in an hour. People were filling the stadium. He threw back a fake smile. I'll be fine. I just need a minute. Minutes later, he sat in his dressing room, sucking in deep breaths. He had a child. They had a child. Pain pierced his heart. They had a child. And Montana had ridden away and left them. It all made complete sense. Her anger, the venom, the pain, the way she was so broken. He'd become the father he swore he'd never be, the kind who left. Tears fell down his cheeks. She'd had to face it all by herself. Except she hadn't. Jason. He stood and punched the wall. Jason had been there for her. A knock came at the door. He didn't answer. Kirk opened the door. Boss, you don't look so hot. Kirk was next to him, his headphones on, clipboard in hand, holding out a bottle of water. Montana took the water and popped the lid, guzzling it back. I'm fine. Good, you've got five minutes until the opening band is done. Kirk walked away, and Montana sucked in large breaths of air. He had to get himself under control. 
When he turned, there she was. Lily. His heart clutched inside his chest. She wore a red dress with a white sequin jacket, white sequined boots to match, and a white sequined hat. He couldn't help but grin. She was beautiful. She'd always been beautiful. He felt the stream of tears going down his face. She came to him, frowning. Montana, what's wrong? Gently, she put his hand to her cheek. He took her hand, finally understanding. He blinked and told himself to get his stuff together because he had a show to put on. Putting his hand over hers, he smiled. You look amazing, do you know that? Her face relaxed and she shrugged. I feel like this is fairy tale life. Like it's all a big fairy tale and at some point I'll wake up. Unable to stop himself, he leaned down and gently kissed her. You won't wake up. If you're asleep, then I'm asleep. She frowned. Are you okay? Pulling back, he put on his fake smile. The country rock star smile. The one that covered the pain and put on a show. This is all amazing. You're amazing. Do you know that? Kirk yelled at him and Montana ran for the stage. When he jogged out, thousands of fans yelled at him. Since he couldn't do anything about the past, and he couldn't even think about all the pain he was in, he did the thing he'd been doing his whole life when things went wrong. He pretended. Chapter 27 To say that it finally felt like she'd come full circle with having Montana in her life didn't do it justice. Yeah, she'd gone full circle, but more than that, she loved him again. No, that wasn't true. She loved him still. Under the anger and disappointment ran a much deeper river of love. No one else in the world would ever make her feel like Montana Crew did. As she watched his concert from the VIP booth, she was mesmerized. He could take the crowd on a journey from peak crazy to quiet love ballads. As she swayed back and forth watching him, their eyes caught. Even from across the stadium, she could feel things were somehow different. It was only a couple of seconds. But he knew. She'd swear to it. When he pulled a stool over and sat, he looked directly at her and spoke into the microphone. We all have regrets. Some we never get a chance to make right. Some we don't even know about, but all I know is some people come back into your life for a reason. He grinned at her. This song's for you, Lily Ray. The song was a haunting lullaby. She thought of the baby he'd lost and wondered if he'd written it for his baby. Their eyes met again, and she was even more positive that he knew about their daughter. Lily couldn't take it. She fled out of the VIP booth and found Kirk, telling him she was ill and needed to get back to the hotel. Something had taken over, making her jittery and sick. The truth. When she got back to the Wynn Hotel, she began furiously repacking all the clothes she'd taken out of her bag. Pulling off the dress she'd worn, she slipped into her yoga pants, a t-shirt, and tennis shoes. She had to leave. How had he found out? How? All she knew was that she couldn't face him. Not yet. At this moment, she just wanted to die. It was happening all over again. She'd given up the baby, watched the social worker take her away, and then made those horrible, weeping, gasping sounds. It hadn't even sounded like her. Jason had been there, holding her and comforting her. It wasn't fair. Tears fell down her cheeks. She finished getting her suitcase packed, and she was rolling it to the door. She'd called downstairs and asked that a cab be ready. She would purchase a ticket back to Billings at the airport. How could she ever face him? As she got to the lobby, a limo pulled up. Montana climbed out and rushed through the front doors. They both stopped in the lobby, staring at each other. She knew her face was a mess, with her puffy eyes and black makeup running down her cheeks. The look they exchanged, 
The looks they'd always exchanged that had told each other everything was all over Montana's face. It changed into a severe frown. Lily Ray, we need to talk about this. He looked around, then pointed up. Upstairs. She was already pushing her bag toward the door, toward the waiting cab. I'm leaving tonight. Montana grabbed her arm, stopping her. Some of the people around them took notice. No, Lil. I know about our daughter, he whispered. I know you know, she stated calmly. As he stared at her, she realized Brad had been right. It had taken her months, years, to get it together and have a normal life. Montana would completely break her this time. She could not do this. He was guiding her, telling one of his people to take her bag. Montana? He didn't say a word as he rushed her back through the casino, onto the elevator, and up to the 45th floor. He didn't say a thing as he took her to her room, and then, finally, he released the grip he had on her. She stayed near the door, so she knew she could bolt at any moment if she had to. Montana took off his black hat and threw it on the couch. She could see by the jerky movements and the way he was pacing the room, he was upset. How did you find out? For a second, he only stared at her. Then he sighed. I got a report from the P.I. that... His lips pinched. It was in my email. All of her nerves suddenly felt like they were in her throat. She coughed. His face was so sad and angry. I... She stumbled back toward the door. Montana was suddenly in front of her, taking her by the elbows and pulling her into him. A daughter? He questioned. If it were possible to actually have another's emotions transferred through touch, that's what he'd just done to her. All her pain and fear erupted in tears. Every part of her was instantly trembling. Montana. He shook his head. Tears were instantly in his eyes. A daughter. You never told me I had a daughter. Then the anger was back. How could you not tell me? He asked angrily. Before she could stop herself, her hand was connecting to his face. You have no right. He took the slap, not moving. The side of his face turned red. Pulling away from him, the trembling was back. Had she just hit him? She pulled her hand to her mouth. She'd done what her father would do, and it was awful. He took her gently by the shoulders. Tell me, Lily. Just tell me. All she could think about was the day their daughter was born. She'd wanted to tell Montana this since it had happened. She'd denied it, tried to forget. But he could never forget because he never knew. All the images bombarded her and it all came tumbling out. She was beautiful. She had your green eyes and made the smallest sound like a little kitty cat. More tears streamed down her face, and she moved to the large window of the Wynn Hotel. The lights were bright, but she felt removed this far up. Like she really was a queen or something. For some insane reason, she thought, the queen of country music. She laughed at the ridiculousness of it. All her emotions were out of control. She focused on the hotels, the lights and glitter of the strip. But the images assaulted her now, fresh and rough. She sighed and more tears flowed. When we couldn't find you, I was devastated. Jason and I went back to Springs Hollow, and I fell into bed for two weeks, barely eating, barely drinking. I was depressed. Then I got up and got to work, figuring if you were moving on with your life, I'd move on with mine. I felt... She turned back to him. He stood there, not moving, in the same spot she'd slapped him in, looking like he was in a trance. I hated you, hated you. I was so angry and hurt. Of course you know how Jason got when I was upset. He was like a fluttering mother. I blamed him and he knew it. He felt awful. Lily turned back to the window, finding it easier not to look at him. I started filling out college applications. I got a part-time job waitressing at Moe's. She let out a light huff. I dragged myself out of bed every day and faced the questions. Where had you gone? Were you coming back? 
Did we get into a fight? Her voice shook. It was fine. Granted, I was a zombie, but I was fine. Until I found out I was pregnant. Her voice broke, and she couldn't stop the emotion that streamed out of her like a waterfall finally freed from a dam. His hands were on her shoulders, pulling her back into him. I told Jason. He offered to marry me. She shook her head. But I couldn't. And you know I couldn't tell Mama and Daddy. You know what my daddy would have done to me. She looked down. Jason helped me figure it out. Contacted people in Denver. Adoption parents. I actually lived with them for six months. She gave him a smile. They are the nicest people. I made sure of it. She sniffed and pleaded with Montana. I was scared, alone. I couldn't marry Jason. He told me he didn't care if I loved you or not. She broke off into a sob. But I couldn't do that to Jason. He deserved someone who could love him like I loved you. Montana listened to Lily, his heart being wrung out like a wash rag with every word. He did know what her daddy would have done to her. Tears ran down his cheeks as he thought of Jason, of what he'd offered to do. He broke free of Lily and cried, anger and pain feeling like they'd consume him. He'd caused this. Him. Let me get this straight. I regret not telling you. I do. I've gone over it a thousand times in my mind. I should have kept her. I should have tried. I should have married Jason. She shook her head. But I didn't. His gut tightened. He didn't like any of those options. I couldn't live a lie. He watched this woman that he loved, that he'd loved forever. And he found that now he loved her even more. But it was all mixed up inside of him. She'd given away his baby. All the pain of losing a baby shot through him. She moved to him, took his hand. That year almost tore me and Jason apart, but he was true to his word. He kept my secret. She let out a soft sigh. He told me until the day he died. Another gulp of grief. I hadn't realized until now. He released himself from his promise when he died. Self-loathing filled Montana. I ruined everything. I thought, of course, she doesn't want me. No one has ever wanted me. I think I always expected that you'd leave me somehow and after... I just convinced myself you were better off with Jason. I didn't love Jason, she shouted. It jolted him almost out of a trance. I know. She sighed and wiped at her face. I want you to know she's happy, Montana. He didn't move. How can anyone really know how a child feels? The side of her lip tugged up into a sad smile. I get reports from her parents every year. She pulled her phone out of her pocket and pulled up a picture. There she was, her dark hair and green eyes, the lopsided smile. He could barely breathe. She is beautiful. I made sure, Montana. I gave her more than we ever had. I gave her parents that love her, don't hit her, don't leave her. Parents who give her everything. For a long moment, he didn't say anything, but simply stared at the picture. He thought about the lives he'd wrecked, his life, Lil's, the daughter that should have been theirs. Anger surged inside of him. There was no way to undo this. Montana let the words come out before he could take them back. No, I could have given her everything. Me, but I screwed it up. He picked up a vase and threw it. It smashed into the granite counter of the bar area in the room. Losing one child had almost destroyed him. Now, out of nowhere, he found out he had lost another one. He turned back, and Lily wasn't by the window. The door clicked shut. Running to the door, he flung it open. Lily, get back here! She was already at the elevator. She shook her head, tears running down her face, her bag being pulled behind her. It's too late, Montana. The elevator opened and she got in. I'm sorry. 
I'm so sorry. He stood there wanting to go after her, but not trusting himself. The door is shut. Leaving. Nothing. Chapter 28 It had been a week since Las Vegas. Lily sat in her office, staring out her window. She looked down at her phone and tried not to remember that it had been seven days. Seven days and a lifetime ago since she'd seen Montana, since she'd left him. All that fire in his eyes had reminded her of the way Daddy always looked before she'd gotten a beating. Squeezing her eyes shut, she tried to forget the horribleness of it all. The way she'd smacked him. All of it. The only thing she could do was work. Get away from the memories, get away from those feelings. Everyone had been great about her coming back. Brad had stayed away. She'd shut everyone out. Charity had tried to reach out, but she couldn't reciprocate. She buried herself in things she could control. Change. Fix. Yesterday, there had been an unveiling of her name on the wall, and she was officially declared a partner. They'd also dumped an obscene amount of money into her account, and she'd sent off the last payment for her student loans. It was everything she wanted. It felt strangely like nothing she wanted. She hated herself for what had happened. While there were parts of her that knew she was a kid and she had done the best she could, there were other parts that doubted. These were the parts that kept her awake at night. They made it so she'd go for days without eating because she was so preoccupied with trying not to be preoccupied. Jason. His face had come to her more and more in her dreams, soothing her, comforting her. She woke up with tears on her face. Part of her loved him. She had realized that, even though she'd never been able to give him what he really wanted. A stupid tear leaked down her face and she brushed it aside. There was a light knock on the door and Charity flitted into the room. Hey. She put files on her desk and took the completed ones. What's up, Buttercup? Charity asked gently. Lily blinked and pulled over another file. Nothing. It's the middle of summer and a hot day. Maybe we should play hooky and talk the partners into taking the boat out. Come on, it'd be fun. No. Lily knew that Charity had been trying to cheer her up, but she'd been smart enough not to ask direct questions. Okay, she said tentatively and turned to walk away. The biggest thing bugging her was that today was Jason's birthday. For the first time since she'd been back, Brad strolled into her office. Charity turned and gave her a worry-filled look. She may not have been told, but she knew. Brad stared at her. Charity, I need to talk to Lily. Alone, please. Charity didn't move. It made Lily sad to realize that no matter what Brad had to say, it couldn't damage her more than she already was. Charity nodded and walked out. Brad shut her door. Lily stayed behind her desk. Brad moved to the chairs in front of her desk and sat in one of them. Lily, I'm worried about you. Of all the conversations she expected to have with Brad, this had not been one of them. Don't. Averting her eyes, she opened a file. Although we should talk about the crane case. Leaning over, he put his hand in the middle of the file. Lily. Glancing up at him, anger pulsed through her. Get your hand off my file. Please, she kept her voice controlled. Leaning back, Brad shook his head. I've watched you this past week. You're broken just like you thought I'd be. Seems you'd be happy. Isn't it what you wanted? Confusion filled his face. I never wanted this for you. Yes, I was hurt. I was worried about you. But I never wanted this sad woman. She flinched. It hurt to hear it. Instantly, the anger fell away. It wasn't fair to be mad at Brad. She was the only one to blame for her problems. Only her. 
Silence reigned for a few moments. Brad let out a long exhale. Listen, I've been thinking. He was your first love, wasn't he? Unable to reply, the hurt still so fresh, all she could do was nod. He stood. Then go after him. Go! Shaken, she met Brad's eyes. He grinned. Lily, I know very little about you, even after all the years I've spent painfully trying to pry information out of you. What I do know is that you had a rough upbringing. She had mentioned little things to Brad. But that's not you, that's not... He broke off, pointing to the front of the building. That's not L.R. Gold, attorney at law. The woman I've seen in the courtroom eats the opposing side's lunch and then grins and gets asked out at the end of the trial. My name's on the door because you were all paid to put it there, she said pitifully, realizing how much it bugged her. Brad scoffed. Lily, you can thank whatever you want, but the partners wouldn't have put your name next to theirs if you weren't good, if you weren't on partnership track anyway. Believe me, they would have promoted you for money, but they're arrogant enough and pompous enough they wouldn't have their name next to an imbecile. It hit her. He was right. Lawyers liked money, but most of them really liked reputation and power. Brad pounded a hand on her desk. So quit sitting on your hands and do something. His vigor awakened her. You're L.R. Gold. You act. You do. She stood, energy filling her. He grinned and started humming the Rocky soundtrack. She laughed. He was right. She knew exactly what she needed to do. Running around the desk, she threw her arms around Brad's neck. Thank you. He held her for a second and let her go and grinned. That's it. I see ideas forming in that beautiful head of yours. She threw her hands up. I don't know what to say. Brad grinned. Lily, I know you don't believe this, but you deserve to be happy. I can't say I'm not upset I wasn't your guy, but you deserve the guy you love. Go get him. She frowned. I'm sorry for- Go! Feeling elated and disoriented, she grabbed her purse and yelled for charity. The door flew open. You rang, Buttercup? Do you think you could help me scale a mountain? Seriously? She looked skeptical. Lily grinned. Come on, let's play hooky. A half an hour later, she was cruising down the highway in her Camry on her way to Devil's Tower. Charity sat next to her wearing pink sunglasses, lipstick to match, and a big grin on her face. This is what I'm talking about. So you're sure you can climb it and help me climb it too? Heck yeah, Charity nodded confidently. I told you, I was a guide. Since Springs Hollow was on the way to Devil's Tower, Lily made a quick stop over at Cindy and Frank's house. As she got closer to Springs Hollow, out of the corner of her eye, she saw a motorcycle whiz past her. Her heart rate kicked up a notch. Was that Montana? When she pulled up to Cindy and Frank's, a whole construction crew was busy working on the house from top to bottom. Cindy and Frank stood outside talking to a construction worker. When she got to them, Cindy hugged her. What's happening? Tears misted into Cindy's eyes. Montana called yesterday and said he'd hired a crew to do whatever I needed done around the house. He said he'd even buy us a new house if that's what we wanted. She smiled and blinked. I told him this was our home, the place we raised our boys. This is where we wanted to stay. She let out a light laugh, but I can't say I'm upset it's getting a facelift. Wow, she grinned. Then she held out the bottle of shells she'd brought back from Hawaii. You always said you wanted seashells. Cindy put her hand to her mouth and gasped. Jason said he'd get me shells one day. I guess he did. She shook her head. On his birthday, no less, she let out a light laugh. Thank you. Lily hugged her. Pulling back, Cindy pulled an envelope out of her pocket. Montana told me if you showed up today, I should give you this. Her heart thudded inside her chest, and she didn't know what to do. Her hand shook as she accepted the envelope. Cindy grinned. Don't fret, sweetie. 
The fluttering had started in the center of her chest. It also filled the lower part of her gut, and her palms were clammy. When Lily got back in her car, she looked at the writing. Montana's writing. Are you gonna open it or not? Charity asked. Lily felt like she would have a panic attack. Charity eyed it. Don't back down now. Montana had known she would come. Nervously, she opened the letter. The words. Meet me at the fort. Chapter 29 When Montana saw her climbing up the hill, his heart went from hopeful to over the moon excited. She'd come. After the way things had ended, all his hopes of ever making her his wife had been dashed. He'd sat in that hotel, awake all night, going over every piece of information he'd learned. He'd pulled the past out in his mind like old paintings in an attic he hadn't examined for a very long time. By the time morning had come, he'd made one decision. He wanted her. More than ever. The decision had been the easy part. He'd taken a chance today. He was hopeful. Seeing her come toward him, all the vulnerability and raw emotion on her face, he loved her even more. She eyed him as she got to the fort, and he could see she was trembling. Hi. Lily didn't answer, just got to the top and stood next to him. Lil. She held his eyes. I'm sorry. She blinked and her bottom lip trembled. I'm sorry too. He wanted to pull her into him, kiss her, love her. But she was that baby bird again, fragile. He couldn't press her. I've always been afraid of how I'd end up, the kind of father I'd be. The other day it felt like it was happening all over again, like I was losing everything. A tear fell down her cheek. I shouldn't have left you the other night. He took her hand. I never should have left you in the first place. Really? Even though... He squeezed her hand. I'm proud of you for finding her the kind of parents she deserved. He squeezed her hand. No matter what has happened, I love you, Lil. I never stopped. I was so stupid thinking I could forget the past. I can't. You're part of it. I realized that I don't want almost everything anymore. I want everything. And everything is you. Just you, Lily Ray. He wiped at a stray tear. And when our little girl comes to find us, which I'm hoping she will, I want us to tell her how much we love her, how she was conceived in beauty and love, how we made mistakes, but we made up for it. Tears burned down his cheeks. I want to tell her about her uncle Jason and all he did for her. I want to have her meet her brothers and sisters. Lily let out a little laugh through the crying. You do? He nodded and got down onto one knee, pulling out a ring. Will you marry me and give us both a second chance? Nodding, she laughed. Yes, Standing, he slipped the ring under her finger and kissed her. I love you. I love you too. Pulling back, Lily smiled at him, and he thought his heart would burst. She winked at him. You want everything, huh? How about scaling a mountain today? I brought Charity. She says she's a guide. He laughed. Actually, I took a chance and bought you an early wedding gift. Narrowing her eyes, she smiled. You did? I booked a motel by Devil's Tower. I hired a crew to help guide us up. She shook her head. You billionaires. They kissed again. It was tender and passionate. Everything it always had been between them. Pulling back, another tear went down her cheek. Are you sad? No. I was just thinking. Happy birthday, Jason. Montana nodded and blinked. You think he's happy? She grinned. I know he is. This has been The Country Groom 
Bachelor Billionaire Romances Written by Taylor Hart Narrated by James Foey Copyright 2017 by Taylor Hart Production Copyright 2018 by Taylor Hart